Hey everybody, what's up? It's Chase. Welcome to another episode of the show. That's right, the Chase Jarvis Live show here on Creative Live. I hope you know the show by now. This is where I sit down with amazing humans and I do everything I can to unpack their brains with the goal of helping you live your dreams and career and hobby and in life. My goal today is to introduce you to a super fine human, um, Jason Fried. You'll know him as the co-founder and CEO of Basecamp, which is a, uh, an amazing piece of software that my photo studio used, used for a long time, for more than a decade. Um, he's also the best-selling author of now, I think, three books, two I've read before, Remote and Rework. Rework really uh, jogged my brain in a way that was super refreshing, and I'm very excited to have him on the show today to talk about his new book, It Does Not Have to Be Crazy at Work. My guest is, again, Mr. Jason Fried. Hey. What's up? Yeah. Yes, I've, I've uh, had the good fortune of sitting down with your business partner, yes. David Hannemeyer Hansen. He's fun to sit down with. Isn't yeah, he's a yeah. good guy. He's yeah. fiery, um, and we have a lot of mutual friends. I've mm -hmm. been looking forward to this day for a long time. So welcome. Me too. Thank, Thank you for having me here. Yeah, congrats yeah. on the book. Thank you. We're proud of it. I love it. I think uh, I was seeing. I think I saw some early designs, or David was talking about as you guys were, and like this is just brilliant. This big, we're happy just, with like, how that turned out. Er, yeah, it was the idea was like. We wanted the cover to say it all, basically. Yeah. It's like, what's the book about? Just look at the cover and you'll know. And that's kind of the idea. And our names are on the cover, too. Which I was did a notice that. Hard thing to kind of get done with the publishers because they don't really, that's an unusual thing for them. Yeah. They're uncomfortable with that idea. Well, speaking of unusual and uncomfortable and not like what everybody else does, it seems to me, having followed you for now probably close to 15 years, that that is part of your MO. You do things differently, you do it to the beat of your own drum. Um, I say in, to, to our audience here on the show and, and professionally, personally even, you, you can't stand out and fit in at the same time, so you might as well do your own thing. Yeah. Uh, how has that been a mantra for you because you've been doing it? Like rework was a completely new thing for me. The idea of not crushing yourself at work is completely new, especially antithetical to our culture. Yes. Is this a, a, a vein in your life? <laughs> Are you a contrarian? <laughs> Probably, I guess, technically, but I don't really set out to be. Yeah, I um, just kind of do what I think makes sense. And maybe my version of what makes sense is different than what other people's version of makes sense fair, is. Fair, fair. Um, I also don't pay attention to a lot of things. I think that's another part of it. I think sometimes people are paying attention to too many things and they become so informed by everything else yeah. that you just think that's the only way to do things. So by being sort of willfully ignorant most yeah. of the time, you know, I can kind of, um, I guess, skip the influences that I probably don't want. Yeah. Um, I also stay away from like the, for example, in our industry, we're in the software business. Everyone's in, here in Silicon Valley for the yes. most part. Yes. We're in Chicago, which helps us just stay away from that world. I think if I was out here, it'd be easier to be lured into it or sucked into it, and I yeah. kind of try to stay away. So I think I probably have a lot of defense mechanisms that I'm not like consciously aware of, but I think they help me stay fresh well, and, and original, hopefully. Yeah, they have clearly have helped you stand out. Um, let's go back, if we can, just a second to uh, some of the previous books that I just mentioned. Sure. The first one was Rework, right? Rework came out. Or actually, you did one before that. We did one called Getting Real, which That's is right. a self-published book. That's right. But, but Rework was our biggest like first publishing book. Yeah, publishing I have it. Book. It's got yeah. like, well, this one again, you guys were kind of to send this to me. It's yeah. dog-eared like crazy already. <laughs> but but Rework looks like a tattered, like a gift that you gave to a puppy <laughs> and it just shreds it because I had really consumed it a lot. But to me, that was the first exposure I'd had to to your all's writing rather than on, on the, the blog. And yeah. again, not it didn't never felt like it was contrarian as the objective, the end goal being to say something that was different than everyone else. But how do you or how have you programmed your body, your mind, your company, yeah. your ethos to think differently? You know, um, I think a big part of it for us is um, Again, like what, what actually makes sense? So um, our company's relatively small in our industry. We have 55 people in the company. We could have many more. We don't want many more. We want a smaller company, which is, again, different than the most, the most people in the industry. They want to grow, 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 yeah. grow. And it's not that we want to be small because they're big. It's we want to be small because small works for us, yeah. for the people we have, the kind of culture we want. And for David and I running the business, we don't want to deal with a bunch of people. I mean, it's just yeah. hard enough to, yeah. you know, to, to get everything right with 55. So um, 
So it's not like we're trying to be different. We're just trying to be what works for us. And I think that we have a, our company and perhaps Dave and I are pretty self-aware about what we want and what we don't want. We're yeah. very clear about what we don't want. Yeah. In fact, we're more focused on what we don't want than what we want. It's yeah. like whatever's left over is actually what we want. So we're very <laughs> like, careful about don't that. Don't want any of these things, don't but want, here, I'll take this. Yes, okay. basically. So, uh, so size is important to us. Not raising money is a big part of that. So like we were a bootstrap company, and because of that, we're able to do a lot of things that you can't do if you raise money. Like we can leave money on the table. We can say no to customers. We can stay small. We can not have to grow or follow the hockey stick pattern. You know, yeah. We can just do whatever we want, essentially, and we're truly independent. Yeah. And I think that we value that more than almost anything else. And how is that? Is, was this come from your childhood? Because it's different than most. Yeah. Um, there's, there's, and it's also different than what's celebrated, which is one of the reasons I think you're an amazing guest, an amazing person to follow. Um, but it didn't... It doesn't seem like this is the the path that you're on. Doesn't seem like the natural path. Yeah. To me, you feel like the exception rather than the rule, again, which is brilliant. Yeah. But how was Where'd it like? It come from? Was it yeah? Was it you know your something your parents instilled in you? Were you always like just? Can you trace it back? I can probably think about it. Yeah. I'm so I'm an only child. I don't know if that has anything to do with it, but I am that. We have that in common. Oh, all right. There's there not we too go. Many of us. Okay. So so. Um, I've always sort of just kind of done my own thing, you know, without the influence of a br brother or sister, basically. Yeah. Um, I think that's part of it. Um, my dad always told me just never work for anybody. That was like his thing. He always just told me never work for anybody. He also said never have a partner in a business, which I do have, yeah. but uh, and it, which has worked out great. But he told me not to have a partner. My grandfather was uh, was an entrepreneur. He opened a grocery store business. It turned into something. So I maybe it's in my blood a little bit. This yeah. sort of doing things my own way. Yeah. Um, but I think I also, I worked in some companies when I was growing up that um, I think, even though I didn't realize it at the time, really informed me. Yeah. Um, some small businesses that I thought the owner wasn't nice, but the manager was nice. I always flourished in environments where I was trusted and kind of didn't give a shit when people didn't trust me. I just did not care about them or their business at all. So yeah. trust had a lot to do with that. Yeah. So I think it's a lot of these series of sort of, of, of moments that really colored my outlook, although I didn't realize it when I was growing up. Of course, but you can only connect the dots looking backwards. Looking backwards, yeah. right? Um, so I think that if I have to connect those dots, it's probably a series of events, plus being an only child, plus my parents being very supportive of me and giving me a lot of room to roam and make a lot of mistakes and yeah. get in a lot of trouble when I was younger, um, and learn from that and realize that independence and doing what you want is good, but there are limits too, and you get yourself in real trouble, so you gotta like, really understand what those limits are. Yeah. And then you can flourish within that space. Um, and not to just do what everyone else does. And I think, um, I saw this with my dad too. My dad um, worked for someone for a while and just was miserable all the time. And then went off to work on his, on his own. And I shouldn't say he was miserable all the time, but he, he talked he a lot about yeah. his boss and he didn't like the work and the whole thing. And then he went off on his own and he was a lot happier. And I think I saw that too, I saw that happen. Um, so it's probably these things, you know, yeah. all together. Um, I also, like, I just never really was good at school. I was kind of doing other things. I had little businesses on the side. I would always just tinker and figure stuff out for yeah. myself and found out that I could do what I wanted. I could figure it out and make it work. So oh, there's a handful of, I think you just did a nice job of mapping that out. So there are a handful of those things that are every bit um, that you wear on your sleeve today. You guys, again, the pop culture movement right now is hustle, Yes, and yes. if you're not, you know, doing 80 hours a week, you're you're not enough. Right. Um, I'm really interested. I think in in be, like culture of being enough. Like right now, today, you're, you're worthy just because you're here. Yeah. Um, inspirations from folks like Brené Brown and others to talk about that that we don't have to perform all these amazing tasks to be somehow worthy. Right. Uh, it doesn't have to be crazy at work to me is a, it's almost like a manifesto, an anti-manifesto to the pop culture train. Yeah. But, this is the obvious question coming at you here nice and slow, yeah. right down the middle of the pipe, but why don't you want me to work hard? Yeah. Why don't, what, what if I wanna work hard and surely I can, you know, if I'm, if I'm compelled to work hard, constraining how hard I'm willing to work is probably a bad thing because then I'm not gonna feel the joy and I'm gonna be slower. It's gonna take me longer to get to quote 10,000 hours. Yeah, sure. I'm just throwing all of the shit you've heard said about yes. 
your books and your philosophy in the past yeah. in one question. Yeah. Why, why are you hating on the hustlers? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, here's the thing, right? Uh, I'll hit this from a variety of angles. First of all, um, to me, hard work and hours are not the same thing, right? So people say, like, work hard. I can work hard in 40 hours, which is I can work basically 40 hour weeks. I can work hard for 40 hours. Mm -hmm. um, I don't need to work 80 to work hard. In fact, I think a lot of times people are spending a lot of time on things that don't matter, or a lot of time on yeah. things that don't matter, right? Yeah. So they're hustling and they're busy, but if they cut out a lot of the shit that they're doing, they'd probably be getting just as much stuff done and actually be able to go home yeah. and rest and get some perspective. Yeah. And this is the thing I think is missing. When you work 80 hour weeks, which is you know, 10, 12 hours a day essentially, uh, you know, well, it has to be more than 10 if it's seven days a yeah. week, but let's call it 12, whatever, Fair people enough. work on the weekends, yeah. whatever it is, right? You know, you lack perspective because if you're always in it, so, you can't get out of it. And you've got to get out of it to see and to think and to have your brain come up with different ideas that you couldn't come up with if you're looking at the work itself. Yeah. Um, you need space, you need perspective, you need a different point of view, you need different experiences, I think at least. Yeah. And I think that these things benefit people. And if you want to be really good at what you do, I think getting away from it is the, actually the way to get better at it. Because then when you come back to it, you come back to it renewed, refreshed, with a new perspective versus being heads down all the time. I yeah. don't know if you've ever worked on something creatively where like you, 10 hours in, like you're no good anymore. Yeah. Like, you're, like I can't, totally. I'm, I'm cashed, I gotta go. Yeah. And, you go and you go back, you get, you get some sleep, hopefully the next morning you have a new idea yeah. that you didn't have. You could not have brute force had that idea no matter how many hours you put in a row. You've gotta get space. Yeah. Do so you, I think space is really valuable. So what does keep going? I, I was, well, I don't the other thing I was gonna say yeah. about that too is that the other problem, or the thing I hear sometimes is people say, like, what about if you're starting a brand new business, you need to put more hours into it? And maybe there's some truth to that, but yeah. you gotta be careful because the things you do are the habits you form. And you cannot not form habits, basically. You're yeah. gonna form them, yep. right? We're, if you're we're using, habit machines, all well, humans were habit machines. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And 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 if we're if you're working, you know, hundred hour weeks or eighty hour weeks or seventy or whatever it is, when you're getting started and you think that like this is the way you do it. This is what you're going to keep doing. Yeah. And by, at some point, you're not going to be able to do that anymore. Maybe right. when you're 21, you can do that because you have nothing else going on in your life. But you're yeah. going to, at some point, probably have a family yeah. or not have a family or whatever you're going to do. But you're going to want to do other things. You're going to have other pursuits in life. Yeah. And you're not going to get a chance to experience those things if you're just busting your ass constantly yeah. because you think that's all you can do. Is you, if I don't work 80, I can't make it. Yeah. And that's just not fair. And it's also not true because um, there's a lot of people who work really, really long. Yeah. who don't make it. So it's not about the hours. It's yeah. about what you do. It's a ton about it. It's about luck. I mean, we have to all admit luck is a huge part of this. Oh, huge. For, for sure. That's, and huge. Yeah, not, not to mention where you were born, what time, what gender, what race. All of what, it. What socioeconomic status you were born into. All those things matter probably more than work. I think more than yeah. pretty much all of it. I mean, yeah. I was fortunate. I was born in 1974. So I went to college from 1990. Um, Two through ninety six, and about nineteen ninety five, the internet became a thing. Kind of, yeah. It was it before. It was before that, like it was a text based thing. Yeah, but I remember like, I had an email address. That yeah, that time. It but was like very in the weird. mid nineties, no right? Exactly. <laughs> in the mid nineties, it became like this graphical thing where you could go to a web browser and look at a website. Yeah. And and um, I was fortunate to come around or come up at that time when no one knew what they were doing because it was brand new, and I got to learn alongside everybody else. No yeah. one had an advantage. And I learned in, in the beginning. And so I've had a lot of time doing it now. I, I'm, I've gotten good at it. If I was starting today, I would, there's no chance I would be able to do what I've done, mm -hmm. um, including our own business. If our business went out of business today and I started another one tomorrow, I don't think I'd be anywhere near as successful ever as what we've done with Basecamp just because we've been doing it for a long time. We were at the right place at the right time. Luck was there. We were good at it, but you need more than that too. Yeah. And so, um, Anyway, I, I just don't think you can brute force some of this stuff. Yeah, that's yeah. really, I think it's brilliant. And in a way, you know, you've heard the, probably heard the adage of like, constraints drive creativity. There's that too. And if you just apply that same concept of constraints to time that you're gonna work on something, it's like, hey, I wanna work a reasonable schedule. I do notice that it forces me, for example, on the weekend or when I'm traveling or and I have to do something. What's the, I forget the law, is it Pareto's law? Whatever that you, ex, something expands to the time. Yeah, work, that, Parkinson's law. Yeah, there you go. Works yeah. expands to fill the time available. Yeah. Which is so true. It's so true. Yeah. And so by setting some constraints, um, 
I think that's probably what you're really getting at, right? It's like those are constraints that you've said I want to place under over my company or my particular day. Do you feel like there's a beautiful little line in the book and uh, uh, fear of missing out mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. what I hear often, especially in this town, we're talking from San Francisco, I just came from downtown, all the startups are all over the place, yeah. I, my home is right in between Twitter and Uber, and it's like you can't escape it. Right, right. And there's literally always something in the tech and entrepreneur scene happening tonight. You feel like you're missing out because you're, you're clocking 40 hours and... No. No. I mean, I feel like I'm, what's the opposite of missing out? Rich with, yeah. uh, I don't know, rich with, uh, you have everything I you I think I have other things to do. Yeah. I can do other things. Yeah. Um, I have no desire to spend all my waking hours in one thing. Um, I have hobbies, I have things I wanna do, or I just wanna sit and do nothing and not feel like I need to be doing something or yeah. showing up to something because other people are there. I just yeah. don't, I've never ever had that. That's never been a part of my thing, which is like, I need to be there because they're there or this is where you're supposed to be. It's just not a thing for me. Yeah. And in fact, it, it, it drains me to have to be somewhere because like you're supposed to be. I don't, yeah. I don't like that. So in the book, just the, the giveaway here is, yeah. is they, they call it Jomo. Jomo. The joy of missing out. The joy of missing out. Brilliant. Yeah, joy of missing out. I, and that's something we, we believe in at work, which is that, um, and that's kind of why it's in the book, which is that a lot of people today in a lot of businesses feel like they have to follow everything that's happening inside of an organization. Yeah. So they've got chat rooms open, they're following a dozen real-time conversations all day long, because if they miss that one thing that's going on, they're gonna miss something they think is important. Yeah. Very few things that are actually important happen in any given day. Most of it is just work. It's yeah. boring, I mean, not like boring like you hate it, but just like it's standard work, and yeah. that's what kind of work mostly is. Yeah. We don't need to turn work into it like a 24-hour news ticker where you're like following breaking stories at work all the time, yeah. right? There aren't breaking stories at work and there shouldn't be, right? How did we get there? Uh, How did we uh, get Technology there? ruined it for us, I think. Yeah. I truly believe that. I think um, the um, sort of the advent of, um, of real-time communications, real-time chat primarily at, business, at work um, has caused more problems than it's solved. And there's some good things about real-time communication. Mm -hmm but I think it's made it too easy to follow too many things at the same time, yeah. and it's sped up everything, where you can't now think about something anymore because everything's on a conveyor belt, and the conveyor belt is constrained by the screen that you have, mm -hmm. and once the conversation scrolls off the screen, like, it's over. Yeah, and so if you so didn't get your word in. It's powerful, isn't it? Like there's a conveyor belt. If there's a conveyor yeah, belt. Yeah. It's, it's, like, it's actually become, in a way we become factory workers again, in a sense, because in a conveyor belt, in a factory setting, like the thing slides by, you're at your station, you've got to put your thing on there before it goes by or you miss it. And that's what's happened at work now with communication, is that communication is literally scrolling by one line at a time, and if you're not there when that thing is being discussed, you don't get your word in, it's over. You can't put that word in two hours later because that's like two hours later is like, you know, 14 feet up in the sky, <laughs> you know, on the conveyor belt, right? right. So, um, so now people are forced to pay attention to everything all the time. And if you're paying attention to everything all the time, when do you have time to do your work? You don't, basically. Yeah. Um, so we're very careful about that at Basecamp. We, we don't make decisions in real time. We make decisions in slow time. We're asynchronous, primarily. We're, we use chat and stuff, and Basecamp has it built in, but we have primarily we post long form messages in Basecamp, like a traditional message forum, like old school like message board, basically. Yeah. And that basically says, here's my idea, not one line at a time, but one thought at a time, and I want you to read it, and you could tell I put time into it, so I want you to take the time and think about it and get back to me tomorrow or the next day. It's fine, there's no rush. You know, things, if, if it takes a few days to discuss something, that's fine, versus trying to rush everything so we're discussing it in 15 minutes. Like, there's no reason, why is everyone rushing all the time? I don't get it, there's no reason for it. It's so powerful. Yeah. I think the. The fear of missing out, I think, in part is you've crafted a really nice response that most of that stuff is just noise. Mm -hmm. um, and what, what do you say to the person who's listening or watching right now saying, yeah, but my industry is moving quickly and my boss expects me. It's, it's really nice to be able to listen to you talk about this great company that you've built, but I got a boss and I got a you know, a, a team, and I've got all these things, none of which conform right. or allow me to try and experiment with this great idea you come up with, with which means it doesn't have to be crazy at work. Yeah. But that's your work. 
Right. So what about my work? So I will grant people this, that it's very difficult, obviously, to be able to do some of these things if you don't have the power to implement some of these things, mm -hmm. right? So some of these ideas are for, in the book, are for the business owner mm -hmm. who's open-minded and going, maybe this isn't a healthy situation I'm creating for, for my people, or yeah. maybe I'm not creating the best environment for, the, for them to do their best work. Like, I expect their best work out of them. Well, if the environment isn't great, then how are they gonna give that to me? So maybe some people at the top are gonna see this and go, okay, there's something I can do. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you're in the middle, and you might manage a team, and you have some stuff you can do there with a team, perhaps, right? And then there's other times where you really don't have a lot of power except your own Agency. local space, yeah. you. Yeah. Maybe, it's, maybe it is you and one other person, but maybe it's just you. And at that point, like, I will grant you the fact that some of these, it, you can't probably go up to your boss and go, if he expects you to work 80, or she expects you to work 80, you can't go, I'm gonna work 40. Like, that's just not gonna probably work. That's probably not the right job for you, and you don't have, but you have to figure out what are you in control of and what are you not in control of, yeah. right? Which is really important in life in general. Like, what do you have control over, what don't you have control yeah. over? And the things you have control over, you can maybe change. And it might be that it's just you, that you have control over your own atmosphere, your own little space, and that if you don't want other people to constantly interrupt you all day, maybe you shouldn't be interrupting them all day, and perhaps, you know, it's like you must be the change you wish to see in the world, like that Gandhi quote or yep, whoever yep, said it. Well right. said, yeah. Which is like, if you don't like what's going on at work, and some of these things might pertain to you, and you wish people weren't interrupting you, and you wish people weren't pushing you, and you wish people weren't calling you into more meetings and whatnot, then maybe you shouldn't do those things. And, and you can begin to affect a little bit, maybe one other person going, you know what, that's cool that Jason hasn't bugged me for a while. Like, he used to ask me all the time, now he's finding out question or getting answers for himself. Yeah maybe I won't bother him as much or interrupt him as much. And so you can kind of have some minor influence there and that's the best you can do. But I think it's unreasonable if your boss or the owner or your manager is out of their minds, like yeah. you're not gonna be able to move them. Yeah. Um, but there are things you can do. So I'll give you another example, like um, something we often encourage people to do, they wanna work at home. Um, it might be hard to say like, I wanna work at home flat out. Like you're probably not gonna get a yes there. Yeah. But maybe you, can, maybe you can say, can you give me a shot to work one day a month at home? Like, can I try that at the very least? And there's a good chance if you have a reasonable manager or boss to let you do that. Yeah. And if you do that and you show them that the world isn't ending and the business isn't falling apart and you're getting your work done, they're gonna be like, okay, maybe I'll give you two days. Or you know, maybe you can just start to build up some successes. And it just takes a couple small steps like that to finally like, build some leverage. Because yeah. you don't have any leverage if you're brand new and you don't have any power. You don't have any leverage, right? right? So you gotta build a little bit here and there, and then eventually you can find the equilibrium. Like, what is the balance that's reasonable for you and your business given the constraints that you're under? You mentioned uh, trust earlier, and I think there's a big part of trust between a relationship, uh, of a company, an employer, an employee, a boss, uh, and, a, and a teammate is do you in particular do anything to to foster that at trust. base camp? Yeah. Yeah. How, how do you grow trust if you're largely remote, largely asynchronous, you know, I'm just I'm trying to yeah. understand cuz right now there are people out there like I want everything that Jason has. I want to not have 80 hour weeks and pack schedules and I don't want to be super busy and have yeah. overflowing inboxes and all this stuff, but like I'm trying to get to practicality. Like Sure. Yeah, man, but like you're just talking about this utopia. Let's get practical. Yeah. I mean, we are in some, like we are talking about our business in this book. These yes. are our things, but yeah. they didn't start this way. We kind of figured out what works for us and what doesn't work for us. And there's other things in here, like why isn't it say 30 hour weeks? Like we say we work 40, why isn't, because like 40 is about right for us. Okay. Maybe for someone else it's 45. You know, I'm not like yeah. so strict in that. 40 is a round rough number, sure. that's the idea, right? Um, the trust thing is important because, I mean, first of all, it comes from a place of laziness, to be honest. Um, I don't want, I don't, like, <laughs> I don't want to be looking over everybody's work because I'm a little bit lazy. I don't want to have <laughs> to do that. Like, I want to trust people to do yeah. great work, yeah. right? And also, like, I just don't want to have to do everybody's work. Because I think sometimes when you're, when you're on top of everybody, you actually end up doing everybody's work for them. Like, I, I don't want to do that, yeah. first of all. David doesn't want to do that. Second, like you hire great people. If you if you want to get great things out of them, you gotta give them room to do their work. Yeah, they're not gonna. First of all, they're not gonna stick around if you're on top of them all the time. For sure, they're not gonna do great work if you're looking over their shoulder all the time. Who does? Nobody does. Um, so you got to give people space and room and autonomy and trust. And um, I think that's the only way to really, in my opinion, it's the only way to get 
the best out of people, and it's the only way to actually build an organization that surprises you constantly, which is what I want. I want to be surprised. Yeah. A lot of business owners don't. They want to know everything that's going on, um, and they want everything to be just right. I, I, I don't care for that. I mean, I don't want to be surprised on the downside too often, yeah. but it's okay to be surprised on the downside occasionally. Yeah. I want to be surprised on the upside because people are doing things, they have room to explore, they're creative, and they come up with something that we wouldn't have come up on with yeah. ourselves. I love that potential. And the only way you get to that is by giving people space and stepping back and letting them do great work on their own. So Brilliant. Now, how can, how can this happen? Yeah, like, let's go tactical. I mean... Well, actually, I'm going to interject one thing Please. before we get to the how, because we have a mutual friend, Toby from yep. Shopify. Yeah. Brilliant guy. Brilliant. He and Harley great. love, love yeah. those, those oh, guys. Great business. And yeah, great business, yeah. Shopify. Probably a lot of Shopify users listening and watching, yeah. like Basecamp. And he, to, and you, you the reason I'm bringing it up is because you referenced it in the book. Yes. Toby developed a thing called the Trust Battery, which is basically, well, I'll let you explain It's great. It. I mean... That was something that really, when we heard that, um, it made so much sense to us. We kind of had thought about, we, we kind of had the principles in mind, but we never had a name for it. And sometimes you need a name for something to really like, have it sink yeah, in, right? We, yeah, words matter to humans. They totally do. And you got to label it so you can talk about it. So the trust battery, the concept is, I think it's Shopify the way he described it, is everybody who's hired comes in a trust, trust battery 50%, basically, which is... We mostly trust yeah, you. Yeah. You're probably going to be good, yeah. but you've got to earn some more, and you can also lose some. Yeah. Um, and so if you want more autonomy, more responsibility, and more flexibility, you need to build up the trust battery. And that's done through personal relationships. It's done through uh, um, examples of doing good work. It's, it's doing the right thing over and over, and you just build up your battery with people. The key, though, is that the battery, and by the way, there's no like actual measure of the battery. Right. It's a mental thing. It's like yeah. you just have a sense of what your battery is with somebody. And batteries are independent and relative. So if we were together, we would have a battery between us. Or actually, I would have a battery about you and you'd have a battery about me. But yeah. your battery might be different with somebody else in the organization. Sure. Which is why sometimes two people aren't getting along and you can't understand why. You're like, they're great people. Why can't they get along? And the problem is, is that their battery between each other is low for some reason. Yeah. They had a run-in. Someone said they were going to do something and they didn't. Someone didn't deliver on what their promise, whatever it was, and yeah. so their battery is low. So it's a great lens to look at personal relationships inside of a business and try to understand why some things work, some things don't, when you can't possibly understand why. Um, it's because everyone's got their own relative battery. So that's something that we thought about a lot, and we basically assume that people come in about 50% as well. Mm -hmm. And if people's battery is low with somebody, you have to kind of figure out why and what's going on. You've got to figure out how to build that up. Because if you and I have a good relationship, it doesn't affect someone else who has a bad one. Yeah. They need to have a good one with, with the other person. So you kind of have to recognize that it can only be repaired directly with individuals. So you might facilitate some stuff with them or put them on projects together or not put them on projects together if they're rubbing the wrong way yeah. and figure out other ways to have some good experiences between them so they can build their battery back up again so they can trust each other again. Such a good concept. It's such a great, I mean, Toby nailed that. It's, it's really good and it really, and when you begin to look at it that way, a lot of things that didn't make sense in the organization begin to make sense. You go, of course, that they have a low battery between them. And then you figure out how do we fix it. Trust battery. Trust battery. Brilliant. It's great. So presumably you've thought a lot about how you want your company structured and run. And we've talked about how trust is a really important aspect. Yeah. What else? What are some other really key things that you look for that you've built into your company? Just some of the ones that are maybe more important to you? What, yeah. How do you think about it? Well, a lot of it is the things we don't want. Yeah, so, go back to that's a yeah, great way of filtering. That's yeah. how we think about it primarily. So um, we want to remain independent, fully, completely independent, which means that we don't want to raise outside money. We don't want to have a board of directors. So we haven't raised outside money for the business. Full disclosure, we took some money from Jeff Bezos in 2006, but that wasn't for the business. So Jeff Got bought it. a small piece of my ownership and yeah. David's ownership. Got it. So that money went to David and I, not yeah. to the business. We've always been 100% funded by customers and always will be. Got it. So we don't have any outside influence on the business. Um, we don't have a board of directors. And those two things right there have a huge impact on the things we can do. Um, we don't want to sit in meetings all day. Um, so we don't have a meetings heavy culture, which means that we write a lot of things down versus say them out loud. Mm -hmm. So we write, uh, write long form and write in detailed um, passages so people can absorb everything on their own time. 
versus having a meeting where you have to pull people off their work yeah. to sit in a room together to talk about something that has nothing to do with right now, but you're having the meeting right now. It's yeah. very inefficient, actually very inefficient way of doing it. So, we, so to do that, to facilitate that, we have to hire great writers. So That's we don't hire people who can't write. Wow. Very, very, very important. That's actually the, probably the number one hiring criteria. After, like, can they do the work? Sure. Are they good at the Job. thing? Yeah, the thing. But the next thing is, can they write? And if they can't write well, we written. will not hire them. So do you do a test, a written communication test? Or? They do the test for us, essentially by submitting cover letters. We look at the cover letter first. We don't look at the resume, don't care about previous experience, don't care about where they went to school, don't care about any of that stuff. We look at the cover letter, and if they don't have one, resume gets tossed, wow. right? They have to be able to write to us, saying like why they want this job, who they are, what's important to them, why is, this, why is it this job and not just any job? Yeah. Or if it is any job, just say that too, but like, I want to be able to read it. Yeah. And you read the letter and you quickly can tell like this person can write, this person can communicate, they can express themselves, they're clear-minded, they're thoughtful, they're good at nuance, they're good at the subtleties that matter that separate them from somebody else. They know how to persuade. Mm -hmm. um, and persuasion is super important in any line of business because you've got to sell, not like sell to a customer always, but sell an idea internally to sure. your team, whatever it is, right? Yeah. So, so, um, so the cover letter is fundamental for us. And we're very, very careful about that. Um, so that's the writing test. It's not a test, but it yeah. is, you right. know what I mean? Um, so so have to hire a good writer so we can do some of the other things that, that we can do. If you weren't a good writer, you couldn't work at our company and we'd have to have more meetings and that's not what we want to do. We don't want to have a lot of distance between ownership and the product or ownership and the customers. So we have a small company because if we had a big company, we'd have to have multiple layers of management. We don't want to have multiple layers of management because things are always lost in translation as you go. And we just don't yeah. want that. So we don't do that. You know, a lot of it is driven by what we don't want to do. Yeah. Um, it's brilliant. We don't want to have, like for, for a while we had four different products. And to have four different products and maintain them at a high level, we'd have to have more people and we'd have to like, work longer out. We didn't want to do that. Yeah. So we said, like, let's not have those anymore. Let's either spin those off or like, kind of wind them down. And let's focus just on Basecamp. And so we didn't do what we were doing before. And we decided not to do that anymore. Right. Um, uh, there's a whole bunch of the don'ts. And the don'ts, again, whatever's left is what we do, basically. It's brilliant. Yeah, it just, at the end of the day, it's about like, you know, when you're an entrepreneur, you're building a company, of course, but you're also building your own job. And it's a selfish way to look at it, but I'm comfortable with that right now, especially, <laughs> which is basically, where do I want to go to work every day? I want to do this job maybe for 20, 30, 40 years. I don't know. We've done it for 20. Yeah. Hopefully we can do it for a lot longer, right? Still having fun. Still having fun. Loving the, loving the work, loving the people. It's great. So I want to keep doing this. So I want to build the best place for me to work, yeah. selfishly. Um, and I'm hoping that, that my you know, judgment is what other people would want out of a business as well. And so you end up just finding like minds who want to work in a place like you want to work. Similarly, or similarly, uh, we build Basecamp for ourselves, the product for ourselves, and just find customers who are like us or want to be like us. Yeah. Versus trying to convince people who don't understand what we're doing to understand what we're doing. I, I'm not interested in convincing anybody of anything. Yeah. I'm interested in putting us something out there that we think is great, that works well for us, that we explain well, hopefully, and clearly enough, and show the benefits of. And if you want in, great. If not, um, that's cool too. Another thing I'll say about a don't is the, this comes down to our pricing model for our products. Um, almost everybody in the industry charges by the seat, so they charge per person. Yep. Bigger company, bigger, bigger bill. Yep. Right. So some. 100 bucks a person, a, a year, 10,000 people, big numbers, right? Well, that has a material effect on the business, not just, of course, on the revenue, which can, it can be beneficial for revenue, but um, what ends up happening is, is that you end up just working for the people who pay you the most. Then you end up having customers you can't afford to lose. And those are your worst customers, right. you know? <laughs> so. Nobody can pay us basically more than 99 bucks a month for Basecamp. I don't care if you have 10,000 people or three people. If the price is the exact same, it's 99 bucks a month flat, period. No per person charges. Um, and that forces us not to do what we don't want to do. We don't want to have to service a few high paying customers because we don't want to have to lose those customers. So, right. so you end up taking good care of them. Then you end up becoming a consulting business. And I, I don't want to do that. Um, so we make sure that nobody we make sure basically that we can afford to lose any customer. And in fact, we can afford to lose 
let's call it 25% of our customers, any 25% at any time, and we'd be okay. You couldn't do that if some paid you a lot and some paid you a little, because if, if it was the wrong ones, you'd be wrong, Yeah, the wrong 25% right. balanced, you'd right. be screwed. So I'm a big fan of a business that looks like static, which is basically if you think about t an old TV, static, right? <laughs> Just all the dots are basically the same, same size, and they're random. Um, I think that's a good business versus a business where you have a couple big circles and a bunch of small dots because those big circles are what the whole business is really about and then you're just servicing a few customers. So, so wow. by not doing that, we can afford to do a bunch of other things that we want to do. So it's, it's these collections of don'ts that give us the do's. That's beautiful. It's yeah. a great lens. I think a really easy, simple, logical follow-up question though yeah. is how do you decide those things? Because there's some... It sure. seems like you have to have this inner compass and you strike me again, from what I've known from all of our mutual friends and what I've read, these things are, they're self-evident to you. They're obvious, they're intuitive, they're, and, and you know, maybe I'm maybe putting some words in your mouth, but it just sure. from where I'm sitting and I'm trying to put myself in the shoes and the ears and the eyes of the people watching and listening, like, gosh, he knows exactly what he wants. And it's actually easy to build something if you know what you want, but I'm a 23-year-old designer who just went out on my own, I'm a freelancer, mm -hmm. And how did you develop your internal compass, your point of view, your style of work? Over time. Okay. I mean, it's, it's modified, that's it's the first, changed. That's the first like, pressure valve right there. Like, <laughs> you don't have to know everything immediately. Hell no. You know? Hell no. I mean, a lot of the stuff in the book we've figured out over the last five years because we've been trying and trying and trying stuff and some things work and some things don't, right? So yeah, of course, when you're right out of school or brand new or whatever, if, if you didn't go to school, doesn't matter, whatever it is. Like anything, you're brand new at it. You've yeah. got to practice to get good at it, yeah. right? Um, you know, no one would expect you to step on stage if you were you know, the first time you ever played guitar and like play. No one would ever expect that to be true. But people have that expectation of themselves sometimes when they start a business that they've got to have it all figured out. But you're on stage for the first time like you would be with a guitar, you're not going to be any good, right? So you've got to like figure this out. But the key though, I think, is that You'll benefit yourself by going slowly. And a lot of people in business today think you need to go really fast. When you go really fast, you skip over lessons and you don't learn them until it's too late. So um, because we kept our business small for a long time, we always have been as small as we possibly can. We just grew within our means. We never got ahead of ourselves. We, we learned the lessons and we figured out what we were good at and what we weren't good at. Um, Think about like if you had a buffet of food and you just tried to taste everything really fast, like you wouldn't really know what you liked and what you didn't because all the flavors would blend together. It would just like wouldn't be pleasurable. But yeah. if you had a week to sample all the food like slowly, you'd go, yeah. I like that, I like that, I like that, I like that, I don't like that, I don't like that. When you move slowly, you give yourself a chance to think it over yeah. and to feel it and really know what it is and to absorb it. Um, it's the same way, um, another food analogy, like if you eat really fast, you don't know you're full until it's kind of too late. Yeah. If you eat slowly, you don't eat as much because you feel it. Your body takes some time to adjust to, to what you're eating. And um, I think the same thing is true in business. So for us, it's been a matter of moving slowly, questioning what we're doing, reflecting on what we're doing. We reflect a lot. And go, Is that worth it? Was that, did that make sense? Was this what we want to do again? Would we want to do the same thing again? And thinking, another thing I always use a little, like, um, I don't know, a little trick perhaps, is just like, I, whenever I make a decision, I go, Will I be happy with this in a year? And I don't know, but I think about that. I go, I know I'm making it about now, but will I regret this decision? And I'm not always right about it, but I've gotten better at honing that instinct. And so that's another framework that I use a lot. Will I not be happy about this in a year? Because it's really easy to make short-term decisions that you think like for right now, yeah. but you know, you're stuck with a lot of these decisions and, and like, you, know, you don't want to regret these things. I don't want to pile up regrets as I go or pile up things that I just wish I hadn't done. I don't want to do that. Um, so I just think moving slowly is the way to do it. But it's hard for people, yeah. because the expectation, to get back to your point, like society and the entrepreneurial community, whatever, is all about speed. Gary Vaynerchuk wants you to go real fast. Gary, He's been right. on the show, good friend. Love Gary. Sure. I love Gary. Yeah. We disagree on probably 10% of things, but yeah. he's spot on on everything else, I think. <laughs> but yeah, he definitely has a very different perspective on, on speed and hustle and growth and 24-7. If you're not working hard enough, someone else is going to outwork you. Yeah. And I don't believe there's such a thing as outworking anybody. Um, because that's all about when you, say, when you talk about it that way, you're taking out a variable, which is, does the work even matter at all? 
A lot of people can work hard and long and jump from one meeting to another and one coast to another and go to this networking event and go to this conference and yeah, you're busy. Yeah, yeah you're playing the game. You're, you're acting like, a, uh, like you're an entrepreneur and you're busy and you're doing it, but like, are you really doing what matters? That's the real question. And so that's why I don't like the whole aspect of like working long and hard and all the time because it, it doesn't um, consider value and quality in that in that work. Yeah. Now Gary would say, like Gary would agree. He would say, if he was sitting here, he'd go, totally. You got to do what matters. If you're not doing what matters, you're a fucking idiot. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And he's right about that too. Yep. But you don't hear that talked about enough. You just hear about like the hustle and right. the time and the hours. Because those are also things. What, what I, I've learned in this and in a previous life where I was primarily a photographer, it's like you. It's like if you're not doing the thing someone else is and therefore they're getting better at your craft and everything's relative because I got to be faster than Bobby or Sally or whatever in right. order to get the get the prize. Right. But it's just not true. It's not tr- I don't think it's true. Yeah, it's like I've come to realize that it it can't be true. It can't be true. Cuz it's cuz the understanding would then be that if you just work hard enough, you will get all the work that's possible in the world. Right, right. Like you can't do all the work anyway. Right. There's right. so much work and so many clients and so many things that you can't possibly command it all, or or whatever. So yeah, busy is sort of a shows not really being effective, but it's a, it's more of a lack of priority. It seems like right. Yeah, and the other thing, yeah, yes, I agree. It really is. And um, and the other the other reality I think is that in any given day, you only probably have a good couple hours, three four hours max of really good work anyway. In your in you. Yeah. You can't, you're not really working an eight hour day or a 10 hour day or a 12 hour day like on the thing. You're probably not actually. Yeah. Um, so a lot of time is wasted even in, in a short day. Probably a lot of time is wasted on things that don't actually matter. There's so, I think so much. Um, and, uh, one other thing, yeah, actually. This is great. I want to say one other thing about this because part of me doesn't like what I'm saying because I don't think it's fair um, in that. I shouldn't be giving a 23-year-old advice because I'm 44. It's too far. Yeah. I'm too far removed. Like, I don't think I should actually be, no one should listen to me about how to start a business. I haven't started a business for 20 years, okay? <laughs> I can talk about how to run a business. I can talk about how to build a profitable business and how to hire people and how to market and how to build products and how to make decisions and because that's what I do every day. But I haven't started a business for 20 years and I haven't been 23 for 20 years. Yeah. Um, so I kind of think advice has an expiration date. It certainly does. And if you're starting a business, you're probably better off talking to someone who just started one six months ago. I don't care if they've made it or they haven't or they don't know yet, it doesn't matter. But they're much closer to the thing. And I think in our world, in the entrepreneurial world especially, there's a lot of people dishing advice that haven't done the thing that ever, right. or they did it a long time ago. And I think you need to discount that. I think advice gets, goes stale, has a, has a half-life, and it's pretty quick. Yeah, there, it's, it's surprising how much advice there is out in the world. And even I try and be free with giving it and open to getting it yeah. and actually aggressively seeking it. And what I've found is that what, what it helps me do more than anything, it's not like, oh, you know, Freddie said hop on one leg, and so I'm gonna go hop on one leg. It's just like, no, Janine said hop on one leg, Freddie said, you know, do the cha-cha, Gregory yeah. said to do something else, and what I need to do is some, like I hadn't thought about this, and it's really aggregating those opinions into something that works for you, versus just like signing up wholesale for like, work 80 hours a week, or whatever, you know, yes. again, Sally said. It, yes, you should absorb I would say you should listen to me, and you should listen to Gary. Yeah. We're polar opposites of that point. Yeah, on that right? point, on that one point. And you should figure out what works for you. You know, It's not about what I say or what he says. Yeah. These are just points on the spectrum, basically. And um, I think you do need to form a matrix and like pay attention to it. And then you also need to do what you believe. Yeah. And I think one of the things I've noticed, and I do remember when I was younger, although again, I'm far removed from that, is that a lot of people, it's funny because a lot of people who are younger are really confident sometimes. Like, they put off an air of confidence, but they're really not sure what to do most of the time. And yeah. they're afraid to just go with their gut because they feel like they can't possibly know it yet. I think like when you're 
in college you kind of feel it, but then you get out because you, then you're like the king of schooling. Like yeah. you're, you're, you're like you've been through. This is the last year of school. You now know everything. I figured right? it out. Yep. I figured out school just in time to leave. Yeah. Right, but then you leave, mm-hmm. and then you're into a professional world where you're a newbie, complete newbie, and so that confidence goes away. I mean, some people still have it. Some people actually have over. They're overconfident, mm-hmm. which is bad too. But. I think people begin to second guess themselves, like, I don't know what to do, so I'm gonna look to those who've done it Mm -hmm. and just do what they do. Um, And I think the only, if I was to throw some advice back to that time, it would be follow your gut, trust yourself, and like, you probably know more than than anyone does about you. I'm a huge advocate of instincts. Yes, yes. and And the other thing is most, look, I believe everyone's making it up as they go, anyway. For, for dang near everything. Yes, so, yeah. for everything. Yeah, yeah. So like, every business is pretty much held together with duct tape. Um, people are figuring out as they go, they're making it up as they go. You know, yeah, you have ideas and you have thoughts and you, have, you should have a perspective and a, a whatever, but you're still making it up as you go. Yeah. And so the idea that this person or that person has it all, and if I just read their book, I will know what to do, and if I just, they don't know either. Yeah. We know what's worked for us. Yeah, that's why you are so good about articulating that in your books. We're clear this about works, that. Yeah, very clear about This it. works, Express and I want to be very clear because some people would say we're preachy, and I see where it comes from, but really, we're just sharing our story, like, you know, in a passionate way, hopefully, and yeah. we believe it, we believe everything we're saying, but this is what worked for us. And in your environment, in your time, with your collection of people, it's gonna be different. You cannot replicate something. Yeah. So, um, was trusting your instincts something that you had to learn? And do you have some examples of where you went against your gut and it went badly? Um, I've, I've always, I think I've always been that way. Um, trusted your gut, you mean? Trusted my gut. I, I just feel like in most cases, now again, I'm fortunate for a variety of reasons. My parents were very supportive. I had two great parents. Um, my parents are still married. Like I have a lot of yeah. stability at home. They've always supported me. It's, it's important to acknowledge. This. They gave me uh, my, they gave me five thousand bucks when I got out of college to get a computer, and that was like to get going. And like so, they helped me with that. Um, and um, you know, there's there's some things I had clearly, obviously. Um, I got in a lot of trouble when I was younger, and if I was someone else, I could have spent some time somewhere else. You know, <laughs> um, things might not have been been as rosy for me. So like I acknowledge all of that. Um, but I think at the end of the day, I've always still trusted my, just trusted my gut and just gone yeah. for it because I feel like you might as well. What have you <laughs> because got, yeah. if you're going to fight against what you believe, it's, you're not going to have that a happy life, I don't think. So even if this is telling you to go this way and this is telling you to go this way, like you should pay attention to those inputs. Mm-hmm. But if you're always doing what you don't want to do because someone else is telling you to or the data is telling you, whatever, like, you're probably gonna be miserable unless you don't really know where to go. And if you don't know where to go at all, you don't have a point of view at all, then you probably will follow something else and you could probably do well. Some people will do well that way. I think on balance though, if you spend your life doing what other people tell you to do or what other people say you should do, you're probably just not gonna be that satisfied at the end of the day. And, and I, I'd rather screw up, I'd rather not live up to my potential, whatever that means. <laughs> Um, but do it my own way and like feel like I was satisfied and I gave it a shot my own way. I feel like I'm satisfied that way. Otherwise, I would feel like there'd be things I, w- I would have done differently. I don't want to feel that way. Now, when you have a business partner and you have other things, other like sometimes you have to compromise and you debate and you, you butt heads and you yeah. figure it out, right? You can't always do what you want to do. Um, and I'm not suggesting that that's what you should always do either. But I think for the most part, you should probably trust your gut and your instinct. There's something in there. It's innate, and I think it's probably pretty smart. Do you have the same advice for, in, so the, the audience that pays attention to the show, largely entrepreneur, solopreneur, small design teams, of course they're still, it's, it's basically evenly a third, you know, one third of people are freelancers, one third are FTEs, and one third are split between people who are on to like a fifth, sixth career, and people mm-hmm. who are just getting started. So really interesting and pretty even curve across those um, areas of consideration. But let's just for a second take into account the individual solopreneur, entrepreneur starting a business on his or her own. And so a lot of what we've been talking about, like, oh, your partner's your business, set your own rules. and. Mm-hmm. Does all the same stuff apply to a, a, an individual creator's uh, first business? I think it's easier. Okay, here, here's the sort of 
it's not the dirty secret. It's just like no, no. I like calling it dirty. All right, let's not, call it dirty. Yeah, the dirty <laughs> secret. <laughs> um, business only gets harder. It, the easiest business you'll ever be in is your own business, which is you. Now it might be hard because it's always hard. Like getting your first client you. is hard. Yeah. Like you know, of course. Like yeah. if you have nothing and you have to get your, that's challenging. But it only gets harder because you start adding people and they have more responsibilities. You start adding more people, pretty soon you need someone else to help manage those people. And then you've got personalities and you've got politics internally. You, like it just gets harder. Or social animals, so there's social. Tra- yeah, I get it. Right. So so and then 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 like. You've got a b- bigger monthly uh, payroll to cover, and then you probably end up getting an office space, and then you've got rent, and you know, it doesn't get easier ever. Um, so, so a lot of the things about business, I think, like the smaller you are, the purer it can be, and you can live up to a lot of these ideals that become harder actually as you get bigger because there's more pressures and there's more influences and there's more outside pressure and different forces pushing you in different directions that you don't have when no one's paying attention. It's just you. When it's just you, like when you talk to entrepreneurs, successful ones, I know a number of them who've done extremely well for themselves, and you ask them like, what was their best time? <laughs> it was when those, they were exercise. smaller. Yeah. It's when they had like, that, oh man, I remember when we were five people working out of my apartment. I remember, um, I haven't talked to Joe in a long time, but from Airbnb, Joe. Oh and, yeah, right. he's been on the show, I love Joe, yeah. Joe Jimmy. Yeah. yeah, and um, I visited them early on when they were working out of, I think, his apartment, or him or Brian. I yeah. forget whose apartment it was. Maybe it was their apartment. Yeah. I think it was, actually. They were at RISD, I think. Yeah, originally, yeah. And they were working here in San Francisco, and I was, I was in town for a wedding, and, and I wrote Joe, I'm like, I love what you guys are up to. Can we meet or whatever? And he's like, yeah, come on by. So he picked me up in his pickup truck, I think it was, and we drove, drove to, his, to his apartment. And that's where they were, that's where Airbnb was there. And I bet, um, if you asked him today, his, his, like, his favorite moments, I'm sure there's some amazing, I mean, they've built yeah. an amazing business, Course, right? Incredible. Obviously. Yeah. But I bet there's some stuff that you'd be like, I, I loved it when we were in our apartment. And um, so, so it's funny that as, as, as a business grows, it grows away from the moments that everyone really loved. And then you end up having all this other shit you gotta deal with all the time. So we, so it's like the good old days, basically, right? Yeah. And we've decided to keep it just the good old days as best <laughs> as we possibly can. I mean, it's not like we used to, we used to be four people or three people. Yeah. We're 55 now, but we're really trying to stay as close to the good old days as we possibly can for as long as we possibly can, versus jettisoning those, jettisoning those and going off and just growing so fast that you just are so detached from the good old days. I, I don't ever want to be detached from those. I'm gonna run through a short list of things that you've thrown under the bus. Okay. Please. I don't know if you, I don't know if the proverbial bus is not. Is there a short list? Many, it sounds like a long. I don't, list. I don't know too many buses that are proverbs, but so the <laughs> the you know okay. So you've talked shit about ambition. Yeah, to some degree. We're ambitious in a different way. Okay. Well, I'm just gonna give me. Let me give Fine. you a list. I'll, I'll just like, give you a list of three things, please. and then we can go through each of them. Okay. Ambition. Uh huh. Goals. Yes. Again, you're like like literally throwing. Yeah. Yeah. And. Uh, quantity, I'll say, because you emphasize quality. So you're talking about like more people, more. Yeah. Just as the theme, you're generally throwing quantity. You want don't want four products. You want one. You don't want a hundred people. You want fifty people. Right. You don't want quantity. You want quality. Right. So, is this a, are these universal things that you've that if as I'm saying them, do you really unite against? Uh, those three things? Yeah. And maybe there's others, but there's just a theme of those three. three. And I think goals is especially interesting, but let's yeah. take each of these in stride. Yeah, so. I love to talk about the goals one. Okay. So well, let's start with ambition, though. Okay, yeah. I just think we have a different definition of it. I think that in our industry, you'd be considered ambitious if you're working crazy hours, if you've raised a bunch of money, if your goal is to dominate or destroy a competitor, like dominate a market, destroy a competitor, conquer market share, like there's all these these bellicose warlike terms. Yeah. Um, that's what ambition looks like if you were to look at it from afar, right? Yeah. Um, who's going to build the tallest office building? Who's going to you know have the most uh, employees? Like whatever it is, right? That's not our definition of it. Um, for us, it's like, do we enjoy going to work every day? Like, we're ambitious there. I want to have a great day every day. Yeah. Um, I don't always have a great day, but that's that's my ambition is to make sure that my day is f- is free 
to do great work, and that everybody at our company has a full free day to do great work. That's what we're ambitious about. Um, we're ambitious about sharing our story and, and telling these stories and, and showing that there's an alternative to what we're railing against. So that's kind of another ambition is to share ideas. Um, and to make something great for our customers and for ourselves, like that's it. Like it doesn't need to be bigger than that, essentially. I think that, that that's just a different form of it, really. Yeah. Um, goals is, is a great one because um, at Basecamp, we don't have, basically don't have any goals. We don't have, um, <laughs> K- I'm gonna get all the acronyms wrong because we don't have them. KPIs, OKRs, I don't know what the other ones are. Um, we don't have any goals. We don't have financial goals other than to be profitable, which we've been for 20 years every year. But we don't have revenue goals or growth goals or any uh, customer growth goals or any like number we're trying to hit. Um, it just that's not what we do. We don't want to do that. We just want to do the best work we can. Isn't that a goal? Uh, <laughs> yeah, fine. I'll give you that. Okay. But 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 it's like it's not really. It's not a measurable once you, goal. Once you assume that, you're like, okay, Jack, that covers everything. everything. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, basically. Like, I, th- I look at goals as people set numbers and they, they try to achieve those, and then when you either do or you don't, and if you do, you set another one. It's like, if you just do the best work you're capable of doing, like, shouldn't you be doing that anyway? Like, what does the goal have to do with you doing great work? If you just try and do the best work you can, you're either gonna hit it or you're not. If you don't, but if you don't try to hit it, or you just, intrinsically want to do great work, that's enough, I think. That's what we've always believed. Yeah. How do you rally a team, then, for someone who's the leader of a small team or they even just, a big team? You give them the space to do great work, and they're, they're, they're intrinsically motivated by the work itself and proud of the work that they're doing versus the statistic. I mean, if you look at, like, a cabinet maker, do they need goals to be proud of the, the, the big thing they built? They can finish the thing, do the joints, the state, whatever, and sit back and look at it and go, that's great work, I'm proud of that. They can look at it closely and go, I'm proud of that work. You know, we didn't do this just quite well. I'll do that better next time, whatever it might be. Um, you don't need to measure everything to be proud of it. You just be proud of the work and be proud of the people you're working with and be proud of the interactions between the people. And all the things work is so much more than hitting that, that number. It's about, like, what was that experience like? Did I enjoy working on this project? Was it yeah. fun? Was it enjoyable? Did I learn something new? It's that kind of stuff I think that really matters. The human stuff, yeah. Yeah, and one of those, you know, um, I mentioned this to, to, to Tim on his show about, about this thing, this, this moment I had where I was, I don't remember exactly the numbers, I think I was, I was running. I, I, I run. Uh, I don't run as much as I used to, but I, I run, I, I jog, whatever. And I remember there was a while back where I was trying to hit some number. I think it was like six minute mile or whatever the hell it was. And like you go out and I did like a 609 or something. And I was, I remember feeling like upset for a second that I didn't hit the six. And then it's like, well, why does that matter? Did I enjoy the run? Like, did I go out and have a good run? Yeah. Um, am I like, feel like I worked out? Yeah. Um, did I get some fresh air? Yeah. All the things I got from it were the value. The, the nine seconds didn't matter at all. Why would it matter? Why should it matter? Why should I leave that moment being like, ah, I didn't do what I set out to do? I didn't achieve the goal that I made up for myself that I just made. Like, there's no reason I had to run a six. Maybe I should have set it as 609 or 608. Like, <laughs> why did I pick six? Like, why? It's all arbitrary for the most part. So it's a few experiences like that, plus just the recognition that, like, whenever we set a goal that's numbers-based, it, it sort of discounts all the other things that are re- where the real value is. And so that's why we don't believe in goals. Um, and then the last one was, um, what was the you're, last you're, one? It was a lot of, like, you're not seeking well, quant- quanti- quantity. quantity. Yeah, or sort of, uh, I guess maybe it's un- it, it'd be file, filed under ambition. I was looking for just yeah. threads. It's like less people, less... Yes. Um, Less number of products, less. It's, well, it's easier. Yeah. So, like, getting back to the laziness, yeah. in a sense, like it's yeah. easier to do that. Yeah. Um, I think also um, uh, a lot of things that are about quantity and size are are ego. It's all ego. Um, and I've learned to check that as much as I possibly can. And we all have it still, of course. Yeah. Yeah. But just to be aware that, like, why why is it that I want to hit this number? Uh, is it so I can tell people about it? And if I tell people about it, like, why am I doing that? Is it just to puff me up? And I, I'll still do that from time to time, and I'll catch myself and go on Twitter, like, oh, we sold this many books. It's like, why am I, why am I saying those things? Yeah. And some of it is like, because I'm proud of it. But yeah. a lot of times it's because 
of something else that sits deeper that's not healthy. Um, and so, of course, we all have ego. You can't probably get rid of it, but it is sort of the enemy, as, as uh, what Ryan yeah, Holiday Ryan wrote. Says, and yeah. and, um, and um, it's just it's it's a force that you need to be careful about. So. I think a lot of the numbers chasing, a lot of the puffing, all that stuff is really about ego, and we just try to remove as much of that as we can. Have you done a bunch of personal work to be able to work through that, or is this like a thing that your parents taught you when going back to you being an only child and deciding that you were becoming aware that you knew what you wanted and what you didn't, and these were things that were uh, earthly? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Um, I don't know where it came from. I've become more aware of it recently, I guess. Um, uh, reading Ryan's book was was important for me, although I, I felt, it was kind of one of these books where you read it and you're like, oh yeah. yeah. Like I've kind of felt this way, but I didn't really understand why. Yeah. Um, but that's what a good book does, right? Totally. It, could, it, it yeah. like codifies or, or puts into words something you've been feeling or totally. thinking. Yeah. Which is like the thing with, with Toby and the trust battery thing. Yeah. It's like we kind of had thought about that but didn't know what to call it, right? So I think that was part of it. Um, um, I, I feel like a lot of the ego victories I've ever had have been very shallow and very temporary. And it just doesn't feel worth it to put all that energy into something that's so shallow and temporary, basically. Um, and uh, I still have more work to do in this area, of course, but it's something I'm paying more attention to um, lately, especially lately. And uh, I, don't, I don't really know why other than like a few things Got into, uh, read some of Ryan's books, got a little bit into Stoicism, gotten some other things that are really kind of clarifying some of these things for me. And um, maybe it's just maturity as well. You know, I think probably 10 years ago I wouldn't have been ready for some of these things, maybe. Yeah, I wasn't yeah. quite there yet. Um, so yeah. And just also, just general observation. I just yeah. see a lot of people who are ego-driven and they end up miserable because you can never really quench it. You can never fill that thing. You can never, ever get it out of the way. And if so, if that's what you're trying to fill up, if that's the thing you're trying to fill up, you're never going to get there, and you're just going to be chasing like these false things. And I don't want to do that either. Yeah, you know, I think you've done a great job of articulating your personal compass. Um, you just listed a few, um, I guess, influences. Let's pull on that thread just a little bit. Yeah, like sure. other other influences, like uh, Scandinavian design, or yes, or <laughs> uh, uh, or uh, you know, sure. Um, you mentioned architecture. Sure, architecture. I'm a big or the fan. Dalai Lama. You, you yeah, got, you got a, a couple of quotes here. Yeah, so. I threw a few quotes out. Yeah, that's no, good. But like, what are what are just some like like survey mm -hmm. Jason Fried's mindscape and like yeah. what are some what are some influences where what what has helped shape your view of the world? Sure, I'll throw out a variety of probably random things. Yeah, this is this is what I'm hoping yeah. for. Yeah. Um, so I've always been a big fan of architecture. Um, I love walking into buildings and getting a feel for getting a feel for how they make you feel in space. I've always yeah. liked space, so I've studied architecture for a long time. Um, informally, formally. Informally, I, I don't. I would never be able to put up with school to to, uh, <laughs> to, to, to study formally. Brutal. Yeah, uh, brutal. I'm not. I was not good at that stuff. Um, but um, I've always looked at. I like materials. I like to look. Like I'm curious. Like. First thing I'm like yeah, wrought the, iron yeah. is this wrought iron and this is hey, look yeah. at the wood and like what is it like how does it I've well, always been curious about how how things join together um, the quality of something how it feels how it ages I like to look at things and how they age that's how I actually judge quality on things um, so a lot of like modern architecture for example like true modern like today's modern architecture is I don't think it's really good because it doesn't look good in five years yeah. Um, the way, like a lot of buildings are, are white, like there's a sort of trend to make like white buildings, but then you get like rust stains that come down because they use the, like, uh, they didn't use a stainless steel screw in the roof, yeah. you know, and like, so you get like, they don't look good as they get older. Yeah. And you look at things like old buildings, brick, stone, wood, these things just age and they look better and better over time. So I, I like to pay attention to those kind of details and things. Yeah. Um, I, um, I uh, uh, love nature, I love just taking walks. Um, I, I love looking very closely at nature. Um, I think that example that flowers, plants, um, specifically like flowers. I like to go look at flowers because I think like people are always looking through um, design annuals to find like color combinations that work or shapes or like ideas. Like go look at a flower. It's you can't beat it. You know. And if you look really close, you can start to see how everything's like they have. You know. The shapes repeat, and there's just some real beauty in, in how that's and how it's how it's structured, 
and how the colors always bleed together. There's, it's very rare that you have like sharp colors that, that hit. They you tend to gradiate into each other. I always find that to be interesting. Um, and just how, how the, 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 like nature is the best design solution. Like if you look at nature, like these things have been perfected for millions of years. Like this leaf is the best leaf you've e it's, it's ever been. It's optimized. Ever, yeah. Yeah. right? And so people are looking for it towards other software products. Like if I'm in the software world, I never want to look at software to get inspiration. I want to look at leaves. I want to look at plants. I want to look at trees. I want to look at buildings. I want to look at furniture. I want to look at other things that are designed, that have been considered and thought, thought through from a different perspective. Because if you just look at software, if you're in the software business and you look at software, you're going to end up making what everyone else is making. Everything we make, we try to make from a unique point of view, which is based on other things and not what everyone else is doing. Um, primarily because I don't think, again, like I don't want to chase and I don't want to do what other people are doing because I don't, then I don't really understand why I'm doing it. I'm just doing because everyone else is doing it. That's part of it too. Bad reason. Yeah, yeah, but so architecture, design, materials, nature. I, I have some land up in Wisconsin that I've been restoring over time, wow. um, which has been a really fun project, like a 10 year project almost so far. Um, taking this land back to the way it was supposed to be before it was farmed and tilled and sort of invasive species have come in. So I'm doing prairie restoration and some stuff, which is really fun to watch. Wow. Very slow process, and that's something that's really inspiring me. Is like it takes ten years to, to to get some of this basic stuff done. Like you'd come and look at the land, and you'd be like, "Yeah, okay," and I'd be like, "You don't even understand what's happened here in ten years." Like, let me take you through it, and that's really fun for me. Um, what else? Um, I, the other thing is, frankly, it, when it comes to business, I'm way more inspired by the local corner grocery store than I am by Amazon or Apple or any of these companies. Um, in fact, I'm jealous of the small businesses, real small businesses. I've got a friend who owns a grocery store down the street from me, and he knows his customers by name. We have, at Basecamp, we have over 100,000 people who pay for Basecamp companies. Wow. I'll never know their names. I, we're at a scale where I can't actually know our customers. Our customers ultimately are numbers and data, and, and I mean, I know some of them, but I would love to be able to own a business where someone would walk in the door and go, hey, Jim, hey, Joan, you know, and just get to know them and know yeah. who they are. And so I, I, I admire those kinds of businesses and I think about how can we be more like them? We can't really, yeah. but are there ways we can be more like them? Um, so I just, I don't think it's a good idea to look to your own industry and look up. I think it's good to look at other industries and actually look at different kinds of businesses that are smaller and, and get to the real pure side of what business really is all about, which is a good product, treating people well, returning someone's call when they call you, you know, knowing someone's name, yeah. that kind of basic fundamental stuff like your grandparents would, yeah. would do if they had a shop, that kind of thing. What drives you crazy in a, in a in bad a, way? Uh, wasting time. Like I, I cannot stand, luckily I don't, we don't have sort of meetings anymore, but when I was in the client services business, you know, and like doing client work, I'd have to go to meetings. Like they'd want, they'd want me to drive over and talk about this thing that literally we could talk about on the phone in five minutes. And I'd have to like go over there and commute and go there and sit there and we talk for an hour when it was only five minutes worth of stuff, but you're there, so you keep going. And that's one example of, of wasting time. Um, but um, processes that don't have to happen, time that doesn't have to be spent on those kinds of things, um, traffic. <laughs> Hate traffic. <laughs> traffic to you're me is like the ultimate LA, waste man. of time. I know, I know. <laughs> Bad place for that. But I. Uh, Tra like traffic to me is one of those things where it's like, man, is this, I mean, yeah, you can listen to an audio book or a podcast or something, but it feels like a waste <laughs> of time to be doing that in that setting. Um, um, the other thing I would say in business that, that drives me a little bit crazy, I would say, is um, how our industry specifically holds up businesses that are actually terrible fundamental businesses as huge successes that people try to follow. Take Uber, for example. Um, for a variety of reasons, I'm not a fan of, of theirs. I do still use their products sometimes, though. Um, but um, they just lost another billion dollars last quarter, I think. So they're just, they're just hemorrhaging money. And they're going to go IPO, and some people are going to get rich, but it's a shitty business. And, but people look at that and go, like, I want to be the next Uber of. I want to be the next Uber. Like, you want to be the next like, billion dollar loser of this business, like I don't understand why um, bad businesses, great ideas, totally, but bad businesses are being held up as the model businesses. I think that's really unfortunate and really irresponsible yeah. of, of sort of the industry at large to celebrate that kind of stuff. I think there's this a big 
like a cult, we're a culture of lemmings. We're a culture of attention wherever the attention goes. Yes. Everybody, you know, some of it gets attracted and, and that breeds more. And that's why I kind of started off with thinking joyously and joyfully of you all, uh, you and your partner David and Basecamp and what you built in the books as a little bit of a contrarian culture, but not, it doesn't seem like it's in and of itself, like contrarianism for contrarianism's sake. Right. It's really more like, no, no, we've actually thought about it. We don't want to run a business like Uber. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> what don't do want we, to. Yeah, what do we value? We value freedom, independence, uh, authority over our own domain, you know, a lot of, I think that's part of why I was so excited to have you on the show. and. I was gonna, you know, if you could give some advice, I'm gonna yeah. flip this to the positive instead okay. of like yeah. s framing it as, as negative and contrary. Yeah. It's a really powerful tool the way you personally have applied it. So give some advice for the folks knowing that we've got, you know, all sorts of different walks of people, creators and entrepreneurs listening, try and give some advice to them to help them think more like you. Hmm. The first thing is um, I would say, um, do whatever you can to practice getting good at saying no, which is really hard when you're brand new, you come into a new company, you can't be the no person. <laughs> you know, you start a new business, it's hard to be the no person. You, you want to take all the business you can get. I get all of that. But somehow find a way to practice saying no, because no is the only word that will ever protect your time and attention. And that's all you've got. And everyone wants a piece of it. And everyone wants a piece of more and more. More and more people want pieces of it. Technology wants a piece of it. Other people want a piece of it. Yeah. And if you don't have any of that left for yourself, you're never going to be able to do what you want to do. You're never going to be able to think the way you want to think and, and, and act the way you want to act because your time is now owned by everyone else. I'm not being, I, I feel like I'm failing on the question to a degree because I'm not being totally practical. I don't have, there's no like silver bullet, clap, you know, snap your fingers, clap your hands way to be good at this. Yeah. But what I've noticed, here's one like more practical thing. Yeah, yeah. Client services, you probably have a lot of people who watch this who are designers, For sure. photographers, yeah. that sort yeah, of crew, right? Sure. And something I hear from them all the time is, you're lucky, because you have a, you have a um, they're saying you, I mean, they're saying to me, you're lucky yeah. because you have a product business. I have to answer to clients, and if a client calls me at 11 o'clock at night, I have to answer the phone. I say, fuck no, you do not. Yeah. <laughs> that's a place to practice. Just because someone pays you does not mean they own you. It certainly does not mean they own your nights and weekends or any of that kind of stuff. And the, ex the people think that the clients actually expect that from people, but they typically don't. You give it to them mm -hmm. by answering the call at 11 o'clock at night or by getting back to them an email at, at, at 10.30. You're giving them permission to ask that again, and then you set the tone. So the practical basic thing is, and this happens all the time, so I, I know this is a practical one, for all you kids out there, we said we were gonna do that. Um, um, is that if, if it's late at night, if it's 9.30, 10, whatever it is, right? Um, and one of your clients writes you and they're demanding something or asking for something, like just don't respond and get back to them the next morning and see what happens. Most likely, it'll be fine. If they go, hey, you know, what the hell? Like, why didn't you get back to me? Because it was 10 and it's either family time or I'm sleeping or I'm reading or I'm watching, it's whatever, it's my time. Like, I'll get back to you the next morning. First thing in the morning, I'll get yeah. back to you. Yeah. You're my top priority in the morning for my, when my day starts. You probably won't have to do that though. You'll probably just find that people are cool with it. And you just imagine that they were not. And so a lot of this stuff is about you setting the tone and you setting the direction for a relationship, professional relationship with other people, especially clients. So that would be the one practical thing I would say is do not answer that email late at night, wait till the next morning, it's gonna be okay. And that'll build your confidence. And that's one way you can begin to start saying no and getting comfortable with saying no. And realizing that no is a very reasonable answer in many cases. You might think it's not, but it actually is. And that's the best way to build a moat around your time and attention, which is all you've got. I know it's a bit circular, but that's no, where we end up. No, to me, I think it all plugs together nicely. Yeah. So there's a, um, there's a voice inside our head that often works against us. That I know that voice. That creates a lot of <laughs> stories. That's basically my question is, yeah. So do you have this voice? Have you trained it? If we're just habits, what are some of the things that you've done mm -hmm. to either unlearn these bad habits or rather, if you want to put it in the positive, to train yourself to feel good about ignoring that client email at 10 p.m. or, or whatever? What are the yeah. how, how, how do you train your own habits? I think the key is, is, is 
first, I don't think you can unlearn or reverse something. You have to transition into something. So a big part of it is not being disappointed if you screw up again. Because if you're like, if you're, you know, if you're like, I'm not going to do this anymore, and then you do it again and you're upset, like that's unreasonable, and you're putting unreasonable demands on yourself. So I think it's about knowing that any sort of transition between one course of action and another is going to take time, and it's going to be a smooth transition. It might, might be some bumps along the way, but that you just have to set a slightly different course and know it's gonna take some time to get there. That's the only thing that I've found works for me. Like cold turkey is just a very difficult thing to do for people. I don't think it's a really successful pattern for most. Some people yeah. are really good at being like, I'll never do this again, and like they're great at that. I don't think it's reasonable necessarily for most people. So I think as you're transitioning, be extremely easy on yourself. Because you can talk yourself out of the transition really quickly and then bounce back to the bad habit. So I think that's the thing I've figured out how to do. Yeah. Um, it's just to be, be fair and kind to myself as I'm changing. Otherwise, it's not so good. Anything else you do specifically for self-care, you, other than just being kind to yourself? Uh, and, sleep is important. Yeah. Although, like, I have a new baby. We just had a baby two months ago. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Eight so, weeks? Eight I'm weeks saying. old. Um, you look great for having an eight-week-old. Uh, how about your I partner? I don't feel real. I feel a little tired right now, to be honest. But thank you very much. Okay, yeah. My wife is, um, she's enduring a little bit more of it right now, especially in the early days. We have a four-year-old, too. So we've sort of been through this once. But of course, in the first few months, it's really difficult on the mother, feeding and the oh, whole thing, yeah. right? Um, but um, we're doing OK um, right now. But sleep is the most important thing. And there's a great book, Why We Sleep. I don't know if you've read that or I heard just, of it. I just saw it on your feed the other day. Wonderful, highly recommend it. It's really enjoyable and interesting. Smart guy, but can write a book in a really approachable way, because I'm not a scientist, and, yeah. but it's scientific. Um, wonderful book, but sleep is the one thing that affects everything. So you gotta exercise, you gotta eat well and all that stuff, but you could actually eat like shit for a week and you'd kind of be all right. You can yeah. skip exercise for a week and you'd kind of be all right. If you get a few bad nights of sleep, you're tra like everything yeah. in your body is trashed. Yeah. Like health-wise, you're bad. Your your temper is bad. People know that you haven't slept well. Yeah, cognition is down. Cognition's yeah, down. Yeah, Can't yeah. remember things. Yeah. Um, you, you're not nice. You know all these things. Um, so sleep is really important. So I try to get seven to eight hours of sleep right now a night. Um, usually I like to get a little bit more than eight, but right now it's just not quite possible with the, with the kids. But okay, I'll get back to that. Um, Got exercise a few days a week. I'm not like crazy about it. Like I'm not. I don't. I don't do like you know ultra marathon. No, <laughs> no. I'll do a couple mile jog here yeah. and there. Um, I will. Um, I, I work out with the trainer a few days a week. Um, I'll go for long walks. I'll do stuff. Got a got a rowing machine. Got a bike. That kind of stuff. You know. Move, move your body. You gotta move. You gotta move. You gotta just feel like you just. I, I think you've got to feel like things are circulating. You know. Um, but I'm not a big fan of like. Um, the boot campy style workouts where you're tired because you've got a life too. And if you if you try and if you like burn all your energy by 9 a.m. early in the morning at the gym, it's very hard to live your day out. So I, I'm actually more of a fan of working out in a way where you you end up having more energy at the end of the workout than you came in with versus like burning it all off and sweating your, your, yourself wet and then you're like just exhausted. Like that doesn't really work for me at least. So gotta eat well exercise and sleep, but sleep is so, so critical. And also the other thing is, is, is perspective. Um, so getting away from the thing that you love. Like I love to work, I love the work that we're doing. And um, I want to be able to come back to it every day excited versus exhausted or never get away from it and then you never get to see it again. You know, there's, there's something that's nice about, if, if you're always in it, you just can't see it. You're too close to it. You need to be able to back away. So. That's another thing. I'd say those four things. Perspective is, is really a key thing. Brilliant. Yeah. What about um, your specific personal habits in the morning or evening? Is there mm -hmm. anything you do? Because sleep, uh, and I, the reason I'm asking one yeah. layer deeper is because I was a terrible sleeper for the first 38 years of my life. Yeah. Terrible. Yeah. Terrible. Like I, I could hear somebody and wake up. I could hear someone jogging past yes. my house, outside my house. Like freakish level of awareness while sleeping and it was just not not great. So I shifted gears and did a bunch of stuff. So that's why I want to go one level deeper. Yeah. And you, you started doing a little bit with fitness, but mm -hmm. what about sleep? Are the things that you do in particular to, to drive sleep? Yes. Um, I've been learning more about this. Um, really important. So I used to kind of work out at the end of the day. 
because I, I just tend to have a little more energy at the end of the day, but that's not really that great if you go to sleep. I have to go to sleep early now, like by nine, otherwise, because my son gets up at like 5.30, which means you get up at 5.30. Yes, yeah. so I've got to like go to sleep earlier, so I can't work out at like 7.30, because that's too close to being, so, so more exercise in the, earlier in the day is, yep. is key. Um, I try to go 15 hours between meals. Oh, you, so oh, I yeah. do in the um, intermittent, fasting. The intermittent yeah. fasting, or like time-restricted eating. I don't know, it depends who you talk to. Some people are like, that's not a fast, it's time-restricted, whatever. <laughs> but time, so like I eat, so I eat dinner, and I don't eat breakfast for about 15 hours. 15 to 16, 14 to 16, basically. Usually 15-ish. Um, that's really been very interesting. We can talk more about that in a minute. Yeah. Um, and I've done, um, and then I try not to look at a screen, like a, there's light in your room, but yeah. like look at a screen for a good 90 minutes before I go to bed, although I'm not always good at that. That's yeah. the, the most challenging. It shows you how addictive and dangerous these devices actually are. Yeah. Um, I'm consciously trying not to, and I still grab, reach for it. Yeah. Um, so, so exercise, I try also not to go to sleep within like three hours of eating dinner. I, I still want to eat dinner earlier, yeah. so I have some time. So some of those things have really made a big difference. Interesting. Um, do you track I don't know all? if we're allowed you... to talk about products that yeah. I use. Yeah, of so course. I use something called the Aura Ring. Yeah, oh wow. Um, I, are, you, are you familiar with that product? I just uh, saw their, I don't know, their next. Uh, okay. Yeah, I did, okay. yeah, I just, yep. Anyway. I, I have one in, I have a sizing kit in, in, on my desk. Yes, okay, awesome. <laughs> So I started using that recently. I've used other things in the past too. And it's A U R A. No, O U R A. O U R A. I've used other things in the past which have worked as well. Uh, well, also sleep tracker, sleep tracking things. But what I like about the the ring is that, um, um, so when I travel, like there's other devices I've used that like go under your bed or under your mattress. Mm -hmm. But that only works if you're sleeping in your own bed, <laughs> and I'm not, yeah. sometimes I'm not. Yeah, you're or sometimes now. like yep. now we, since we have this baby, sometimes. We'll sleep in different beds depending on the sound. Like so, it, that doesn't really work for me right now. So this ring is great. You just throw it on your finger, and it tracks your sleep, and it's quite accurate from what I've under, what, I, what I've read. Yeah. Um, and um, it's been very enlightening. I can tell now, like certain foods I eat around dinner time affect my sleep. Um, ex when I exercise, definitely affects my sleep. When I when I uh, if I have screens, it definitely affects my sleep. So now I have some feedback, a feedback mechanism in which to make slightly better decisions and see the impact. And it's not always direct, because sometimes you just have a shitty night and sometimes you have a great yeah, night, even yeah. though you did something wrong. Yeah. But you can see trends and you can start to finally pick up on, ah, yeah, you know what? If I do this, like it's definitely affecting my sleep. So I've been, I've been doing that a lot, which has really been helping quite a bit. And um, there's also a, a bit of a placebo, or maybe it's not a placebo, I guess. It probably wouldn't be, but there's a bit of a placebo when you look at your sleep information in the morning and go, oh, shit, I had a good night's sleep. Yeah. I actually oh. do feel better. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I really do. And maybe it's because I did have a good night's sleep, but it's right. like extra multiplying. I wonder if Laura takes that into consideration. I don't know. Interesting. Yeah. Speaking of devices, yeah. I do want to, let's just shift gears yeah, to that sure, for a second. Sure. So Aura, that, that ring is phenomenal. Yeah. Kevin uh, Rose, yeah. a friend of ours, is also very, very passionate about it. Yeah. Um, so you track your sleep, working out, all that kind of stuff. We talked before the camera started rolling about technology, and I wanted to go mm -hmm. back to mm -hmm. it. You mentioned screens. Um, how does it negatively affect, how, how do screens negatively affect you and your world and your health? You're in the business of creating yeah. things that are on screens. Yeah, so, during the day. During the day, okay, so this is good. This is why I want you to qualify it. Yeah, so actually there's a feature in Basecamp 3 called Work Can Wait, which allows each individual employee anyone who uses Basecamp, to set their own work hours in the product. And outside those work hours, Basecamp cannot send you any notifications or any emails or anything. So um, mine are set from nine to five. So at 5.01, Basecamp is essentially holding my calls to use like an old, old yeah. parlance basically. Yeah. And I will not get a single notification from Basecamp until the next morning. So that's like our little tiny role in the world is to like try to create some work-life separation there. Yeah. Um, these devices, I think, are extremely dangerous because they're just like hitting your dopamine receptors or whatever. I don't know the science, but yeah. like you have dopamine constantly, yeah. right? Picking this thing up, picking this thing up, picking this thing up. They're addic highly addictive. Yeah. They reward addictive behavior. Um, I found them to be also a gateway for negative information to get into your brain. Um, I, I think that um, if you 
I found that Twitter specifically, um, Twitter specifically, like if you're even like friends that you follow, there's just a lot of bitching on Twitter. Yeah. And there's a lot of negativity on Twitter. And some of it's negativity you might agree with. Some of it's negativity you may not agree with, but I still just don't even want it, even if I agree with it. Because I don't want I don't want to get enraged about stuff. I don't yeah. want this thing to make me pissed off. Yeah. And it does a lot of the time. And I, I so I've been really working on not paying attention to that and, and hiding people or muting people that I, that are, are posting anything that's that's not Probably like hurt, uplifting yeah. or yeah. anything, you know. Um, um, and so I think that this is a way, unfortunately, for 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 negativity to get in your brain and to get you upset about things, and I, I don't want to be that way. Um, I also, that's one of the reasons I don't really follow the news. I used to follow the news, I used to be like a news junkie. Oh wow. And I just like, I don't pay attention to the news at all yeah. anymore. Yeah, and you still get it. You get, you, you get it because you can't not get it if yeah. you pick up your phone. That's my point, yeah. Um, but also like, nothing, I shouldn't say nothing, almost nothing really matters right now. So if I hear about it the next day, if I read the paper, yeah. it's funny, I, I was at a hotel, and they're like, would you like a newspaper? And I was like, yeah, I will actually this time. I'll take yeah. a newspaper. So like, Experiment. would you like the USA Today? Or the I'm like, I don't know, it doesn't matter. New York Times, whatever. So I get the paper, and I'm reading the paper in the morning. I'm like, this is the best fucking format for news <laughs> ever. Right, right. Because it's everything I kind of really uh, want to know or need to know, essentially, once a day. That's enough. It summarizes what happened yesterday. And like that's enough. That's the right cadence, I think, for news. Like maybe once a day, maybe even every few days, maybe once a week's probably enough. That everything is breaking news 24-7, everything's a hot story. Like none of this shit is a hot story that matters right now. Um, unless there's like a natural disaster, what okay, different story. And like you're in the you're in the path of a hurricane, you want to know that. Yeah. A lot of other things can wait. So um, I'm more of a fan of things that can wait right now. Um, and so uh, um, anyway, I think that these devices are are, are polluting us in a lot of ways, and I think it's really unfortunate. And I think, it's, I think the time of reckoning is, is, is coming. Uh, you're seeing people's attitudes are starting to shift and turn, and I think oh, people are beginning to Apple, realize. Look at Apple, like, with screen time, monitoring how much time you're on each app, yeah. what category of I app. I use that. Yeah, and allowing you to turn things off after a certain amount of time. Yeah. Like, you gotta know that they have the data. For sure. And if the data is saying that we gotta give these people control over their own sort of how much impact our devices have on them, that's not on accident. Because right. they're typically, products want you to use them more. That is, their mechanism in life is to engage you. Of course. And if someone like Apple is already sort of curbing that, there's they don't do that on accident. No. Right. right. Yeah, we were sort of riffing on this a little bit earlier, of this idea, like, I was thinking, like, with cigarettes, um, like, by the way, I wouldn't be surprised if, if social media in general is eventually seen as the next cigarette. That we look back on this and go, wow, this was incredibly unhealthy for like kids, for adults, for everybody, yeah. for our brains, for our developments, for our egos, for all these things. Like, what, is a what does 100 dopamine hits a day do for someone? Yeah, it's gonna wear your brain out, it has yeah, to. Yeah. We're not built for that, right? Something's right. gonna happen, and this is the first generation that's had daily hits like that, and it will be for decades. Something's gonna go wrong at some point. But you think about like Philip Morris. Um, they knew cigarettes were bad and they withheld that science. Yeah. And that's what people really got pissed off about in the end. It wasn't that people made a personal choice to smoke cigarettes. It was that the companies knew they were bad and didn't tell you, basically. Um, and you kind of wonder in some ways if these technology companies are beginning to heed that call and go, you know, we should be getting in there early. We know. Like you said, they have the data. We yeah. know this stuff is probably not good for you, even just for sleep. Yeah. Like sleep affects every system in your body, and they have, um, I forget what it's called now, a night night shift or whatever, yeah, and, yeah. And the, on the Mac and yeah. then the phone, they, and it's good. Shifts, and by the so way, I think it's orange. great yeah. that, that these things exist, but it's kind of also like, you could almost cynically say that this is um, a way to, to, to guard against the liability. That yeah. We know this is bad and we're giving you tools to prevent it. Um, like you wouldn't imagine a cigarette maker ever making a cigarette pack that would only dispense three a day. But that's kind of what Apple, and I don't know if, Google, if Android has the same stuff, probably does, yeah. is kind of doing. They're saying like, we're giving you the tools to do that. because You can override it, there's a button on the bottom yeah. that'll let you override it. You can it, override it because it's freedom. Yeah. You can do whatever you want. <laughs> because freedom. <laughs> yeah, but at some point, like you know how they have like haptic feedback on the yeah. screen? Maybe they'll have like electric shock. You're like, Extend for 15 minutes, like, like don't do that, you know? <laughs> or like, you'll have to pay for that. But um, anyway, I think, that, I think that 
you're right that they have the data they know, and these definitely are affecting us. And we're going to see what, it, what the effects are in a number of years. I think it's too early, but people are beginning to start to notice. Yeah. And I think the general pushback against, too, against companies like Facebook and these other companies where they're saying, like, on an, uh, this is probably a net negative. Yeah, I know it's cool to get together with your high school friends or stay in touch with, with long lost relatives. Like, yeah. there's definitely value in that, sure. for sure. But net negative with, because of everything else. And I think people are starting to wake up to that. It's happening. So that's, those are a couple of things that, yeah. are, that we think are weird or piss us off or frustrated. Let's flip yeah. the script. Like, yeah. what are some things you love? Yeah. Um, what is, like, just again, wild, feel, feel free to cover any domain. Like, yeah. what are some things you love? I love seeing, um, <laughs> it's funny, there's this book, um, God, I can't remember what it's called now. Let's see if I can remember. It's a book on, um, there's two of them, I think, on Russian folk like folk inventions and Eastern European ones where they, this, this person went to these, these, I guess these small Russian towns where people didn't have much during communism specifically, but they needed things. Like they needed a shovel, but they, they couldn't afford a shovel. There was no shovels at the store. And so um, they would take like a stick and an old coffee can and like make a shovel out of it. And um, what I, I love the, those two books because there's this, this catalog of these in, super, super clever inventions. And what I'm getting at there is I love um, ingenuity. I love when I see people solve a problem in a clever way that's the simplest possible way to solve the problem. Because there's, there's like, you could brute force some solutions to things, and then it doesn't seem as interesting. Mm -hmm. But when people have very little and they solve really clev clever, creative problems, I really, that's something, whenever I see that, it always makes me smile. Whatever it is, doesn't matter what it is. It, that's the kind of stuff I really dig. Um, I love things that are just built well to last. Yeah. So one of my weird hobbies is I collect vintage watches. And um, this is actually a new watch, this is not old. Um, but I mostly collect older stuff because they work forever. And they are built to last forever, essentially. And as long as someone oils it and cleans it once every decade, essentially, it will last forever. And that's an amazing thing to that me. That is an amazing thing. That I can put a watch on that's 75 years old and it works just fine. And nothing we make today, oh, not nothing, most of things we make today will not last anywhere near that long because yeah. we don't live in that kind of world anymore. Yeah. Devices we use are you know, extinct, essentially, in a few years. Um, a lot of the things we make today are disposable. They're, they're meant to be disposable, and there's a ton of waste around that. So I love running into things that go like, this is well-made, it's gonna last, and it's worth paying for. Um, so I, I love whenever, it, it could be furniture, it could be a piece of clothing, it could be uh, a home, it could be anything. So I love that kind of stuff. I also love looking at things that, things that I could never do. That's the kind of stuff I love the most. Yeah, like, like, like a like not like some rugs you look at that are like hand knotted. Yeah. Like I've looked at some of these Turkish rugs, like you know, and and to think that someone hand knotted that design, and I don't know how long it took, but it took forever. I'm like I couldn't, I actually couldn't do that, and I'm so impressed. I'm so thoroughly impressed by that kind of stuff. Um, so like. I love that kind of stuff that just blows me away. Like what an amazing pursuit and patience and artistic ability and all those things, that, that kind of stuff, that like kind of combination of things always gets me. Um, uh, simple, like just again, being out in nature and yeah. just seeing, um, just seeing the, the inventions of nature. I just love that. I, it's funny because like, there's nothing in nature I don't like. and. There's a lot of things you can say that you don't like about other things, but it's hard to like go out in nature and go, I don't like that. So true. You know, just yeah. everything is just, it's just right. It's just right. And um, seeing, that, seeing natural systems work is really fascinating to me. And anyway, I can go on and on, but there's a lot of things I like. Um, I also like really well-written sentences. So well, I just love yeah. sentences. Precision and yeah. craft and, yeah. There's a great book um, that I like called um, on Writing Well, I think is the, the, the title of it, and it's got a terrible cover. It has like a CD on it. It's like, I don't understand the cover. But it's... It's, t it's not... Uh, it's, I'm sorry, it's, it's called Revising Prose. Okay. By the way, On Writing Well is another good book about writing, revising prose. And this guy talks about how to write sentences. And he just squeezes all the fat out of them, but doesn't make them sterile. And I think that's the real art. How do you like really compress a sentence and be concise, but also let it flower, you know? And there's something really beautiful about really well-written sentences. So I love, like, whenever I read something, I'm like, that's a good line. 
Like, I, or I hear something, I watch a movie, like, yeah. that's a great line. I love lines, you know? Um, uh, I don't know. Uh, there's so these more. Are, these there's are, more things. But these are all beautiful. What about yeah. some resources for other people? You've listed a couple of books. Yeah. Is there a couple of things that you're just, are, are just like Jason Fried go-tos? <laughs> Um, and that was a fine answer. Or, like, I, I, I yeah. hate when people ask me. That's why I'm not yeah. saying like superlative. Like, what's your favorite? Because right, right. I hate being asked those questions because yeah. it's like I'm on the like, spot on yeah, those. Yeah, I, I don't got, know. I got a favorite thing right now. Um, I, I, um, I think for me, it's it's. This is not like what I'd recommend specifically, but it's a kind of a direction, which is find something that's sort of parallel to what you do. Mm-hmm and get into that. So that's what I've always found to be enlightening. So for example, I'm into like technically graphic design, software design, mm-hmm. but I like architect I pay attention more to architecture and furniture design yeah. and that kind of stuff which is close enough to what I do where I can draw some yeah, lessons from it. Yeah. But I'm not but it's new and it's different and I have a, I have to use a different part of my brain to think about why it's good and why it's not. So I think that's one thing like as a general go-to like what do you kind of do and Maybe if you're a cook and you're, you know, like you're you're really deep into Italian food, like get into Spanish food for a while and just like it's still cooking. Yeah. And learn, you know, that kind of thing. Adjacent areas of knowledge. Adjacent and, areas yeah. of knowledge. Yeah. I think that's something I would recommend people get into. Um, I would also just say take more walks without a device and just look up. Everyone's like looking down. I feel like we're gonna have these like really strong necks in the future where we're not actually gonna be able to look up, you know? Cause like everyone's just <laughs> always looking down. Like big eyes and a hunched over neck. Yeah, and, yeah. totally, something like that. There's gonna be some Alien. weird thing, right? Alien look. Just walk around, like get out in the woods, walk around, look look around, um, that kind of stuff. Um, which is, you know, not, it's not, the cool thing is, is I know in some areas that's harder to do, but it's accessible at some level for most people and, and it doesn't cost anything, you know, just to go take a walk. Hopefully into some woods. Yeah, you know? it's amazing how refreshing that can be. It really is. So, um, so yeah. I'm going to try and bring this back to work now. Okay. So Let's see if you can do that. I do love, <laughs> but to me that's the a, a real core message that the show has been about for ten years now, which is areas of influence outside. That's why the show is developed, in fact, because yeah. I wanted to like learn from other people who are outside my area of expertise to bring them in and to be able to be inspired and whatnot. So. Are there influences of outside? You're very clear of saying like this is how we do it. Yeah. Are there pl- other places that are at work are inspiring to you? Like, do you look at other companies? Yeah, other yeah. companies or yeah. other cultures or yeah. or you were very careful, I think, and that's part why can, you can do a good job of making such bold statements. Is like what, what I'm saying right here is not for everybody, but it works for us. Right in line with the questions about your outside inspirations and now bringing this back to work, yeah. are there other models that you look to for like brilliance and work style? And Yeah, I mean, I admire any organization of any kind that, that works um, it, that's sustainable. So, um, so but, but I'll give you something specific actually because that's, that's very broad and not very helpful. Um, one of the, the guys who in, inspired David and I a lot early on was this guy named Ricardo Semler. Okay. And you should try and get him on your show. Wow, okay, um, Ricardo. He's great, he's from Brazil. And um, he wrote this book called Maverick, which was a book about his business. He inherited this business from his father. I think it's a big, like, it's a Brazilian company, big industrial company. They make like oil pumps for oil tankers, like big, huge, completely different from our world. Industry. Yeah. Industry, yeah. like hard, in, heavy industry stuff, right? He got this business from his father, because that's how it works in Brazil, it's handed down. Mm -hmm. He gets this business, I I feel like I remember, this book is a while, it's it's been probably 15, 20 years since I've read the book, or 15 years or something. But I remember he he said something about like, he got this big rule book. He started looking through the book, and he's like, I don't understand any of this, none of this makes sense to me, we're gonna throw this out, I've inherited this business, but I'm gonna do it my own way. I'm gonna go talk to people, like how should we run this thing, and what should we do here, and what, what are the things we should do, what's different? And he came up with a vastly different way of running a business in a very traditional country, in a very traditional industry. So he did things like, um, we don't do this, but um, everyone's salary is out in the open. Everyone can see whatever they make, and they can give themselves raises. You give yourself a raise, because it's public. So if you're gonna give yourself a raise, 
and everyone's going to know what you're giving yourself. Like, there's some self-regulation there because you're not going to. And also, if you don't live up to your new salary, like you could lose your job. So, but it's about like, what do you think you're worth, and why don't you prove it? Yeah. And I thought that was we haven't done that, but that's really interesting. Yeah. Um, he would he would let their em- employees hire managers. Typically, a manager would hire employees, but the employees that get to hire their own manager. Yeah. Yeah. It's really like, and some of the stuff has been adopted in other places, but it's still very rare. And like 15 years ago or so, it was very, very rare. Uh-huh. Um, the factory floor where they made the stuff can be rearranged by the people making making the stuff. Yeah. They can paint things any color they want. They can move machines around any way they want. Um, it's not like a foreman's job to say this is how it has to be. Um, they, um, uh, he was very early about like working reasonable work hours. Yeah. Um, his whole feeling was like. If work can take you away from life at 3.30 in the afternoon on Sunday for a call, like why can't you go see a movie at 3.30 in the afternoon on a Monday like while you're supposed to be at work? Yeah. Like it's got to be equal. Um, so he's very big into that. Um, One more time with his name. His name's Ricardo Semler, and yeah. the book is called Maverick. He wrote another book called, I think like, um, I can't remember. The, it's something about Seven Day Weekend or something. But there's another book out with a similar title, so it's not. I'm not sure. Just look up his okay. name, Ricardo Semler and Maverick. Okay. Highly recommend reading that book. He's also the cool thing about him is he's taken these ideas and brought it into education. Oh wow! In Brazil, um, so he's opened schools around a very different method of education rather than like a very traditional classroom lecture style yeah. teacher thing, yeah. um, sitting behind desks, and made it very participatory. Cool. And it's, apparently, it's been. From what I understood, at least back then, it was doing very well. I don't know how it's doing now or what sure. he's doing, but um, really fascinating guy. I've drawn a lot of inspiration from him, saying yeah. like, you just don't have to do things the way everyone else does, and find the thing that works for you. And just because no one else has done it doesn't mean it doesn't work. Yeah. And just because everyone else is doing it this way doesn't mean it's working either. They're just doing it this way, um, which is why the same thing about like um, people work as we saw, talked about in the beginning. Like working long or working hard doesn't mean you're working well. It just means you're working hard and working long. Yeah. It doesn't have any correlation with actually the output quality, of what you're producing, right? the quality. Yeah. So it's very similar there. So he's wonderful. Anybody else? Any I mean, other? people like, I mean, this is such a cliche, boring answer, but like um, uh, Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger. Yeah. Um, I just so admire those guys. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's hard not to, I suppose. But what I admire about them is their, their fundamental understanding of what matters and what doesn't. Um, their, their focus on value, um, their rejection of trends in favor of just what's sound. Um, and they're like, Charlie Munger is just like a quote machine. He's just so, <laughs> so true, so thoughtful and so smart. And he's like 92 and still, still there. Um, the other thing is like Berkshire Hathaway, the company, which is a massive company, I believe they have something like 25 or 30 employees, that's it. Uh, give or take yeah. to five or 10. But like small company, the companies they run are large, but this group that, man, that, runs, uh, that, that owns the companies is actually quite small. And so I take a lot of inspiration from that too, that they can do that with a small crew and that they've chosen to do it with a small crew. Yeah. So I love those guys. Um, they're one of a kind, or they're two of a kind, I guess. <laughs> and, but it's also like the, the, it's sort of the end of an era because they're both 80s and 90s now. Um, but I really respect and admire them, and I love to read all the like Warren Buffett's um, letters to the, to his shareholders. Brilliant, must Mu- read. They're must read for yeah. anybody. Yeah, if you're listening right now and you haven't oh. uh, ever read one of those letters, you should just go search the internet right now and go read one. Must read. Yeah, must read. They're so good, and they're not only like they're just it's great prose. It's clear-minded writing. Um, I could see how you would just love it. So good. <laughs> it's so good. It's so good. And I don't even care, like yeah. you don't have to care about business. It has nothing to do with business, business like money or anything. God damn, it's so good. It's it just is. so good. So I love that. Um, Bezos has been writing really good uh, shareholder letters too. He's clearly inspired by them. Yeah. So I like I like writing his or reading his stuff as well. So a uh, couple of Bezos things to mm-hmm. to uh, wrap us up. You talk yeah. about um, well, he talks about being wildly misunderstood for long periods of time. Do you feel like that's what's happening right now? That you're, you've got it right with business and uh, and the way to work, because you really wor- you really write about work, um, and and it's just you're being 
people are misunderstanding you. You're, you're, you sell a lot of books, and you have a lot of fans and customers. Sure. But uh, for pop culture, they're they're going to come around at some point. You're going to be on the right side. Of the I think street. this can get worse before it gets better. Okay. I think at some point it's going to turn. And it's interesting because it's there's there's is a trend. I mean, by the way, this is primarily an American problem. Yeah. Um, in Germany, they primarily work 40-hour weeks, and they do amazing work. Yeah. Scandinavian countries work. France, I believe, they're cutting their back. 34, 32 now. 32 yeah. now. And um, some people in America, like, I used to feel this way. Like, well, they're, you know, but look what we've built, and yeah. look what they've done. It's yeah. like, yeah, but they're they're happier, and so they funny. They're taking, and They've been taking August off for, like, 500 years. Yeah. And now we're like... I don't want to work so much in August. It's really nice to have more right, time. Exactly. All of my internet tech friends are trying to figure out how to work less in August. And there I'm you like, go. Yeah, the, when I they lived in France, out. I was like putting my feet up. Totally. You know? And and like, there's more to life than work. You yeah. know, that's what they figured out, yeah. right? So, um, so I, I do think I think in time, more and more of these ideas will will um, will sort of um, ripen up for other people. But I think it might be a while. I think it's going to be get worse for a while. Disagree and commit. Yeah. Another Bezos quote. That was a Bezos thing, um, which is um, something we, we've practiced as well, but again, didn't really have a name for it, yeah. which is this idea that um, it, it base camp decisions are not made by consensus or by voting. Um, people will gather around and will talk about it, and people will have input, um, but then somebody makes the decision. And, and so is it like a product owner or whoever's in charge of that Whoever's thing? in charge of that thing. Yeah. Um, it doesn't matter like what rank or role or any of that stuff it's like whoever's in charge of that thing because we depends on the on the project but there's always one person whose whose job it is to make a decision and consider and then it's everyone else's job to either agree and commit or disagree and commit and disagree and commit going like i don't agree but i'm in Mm -hmm. because you got to get you got to get you got to get in line then do do the work because something else might come down the road where someone else disagrees with you and you're going to count on them so but the amount of effort that's required to get everyone to agree on something is often not well spent. Mm-hmm. You're better off, of course, listening, having a vigorous debate, and then going, okay, here's what we're going to do, and then going. I love and so it. that's that's the idea behind you, disagreeing. You, and David and I do this with each other occasionally. Yeah. Like, we'll be battling, and it's like, you know what, David, you want this one more than I do. So like, I don't think it's the right decision, but let's do it. I'm cool with that. And it's kind of like two friends going out for lunch, like you got this one, I get the next one. Like yeah. you don't know how it all evens out, but it kind of evens out in the end. Yeah. It's sort of similar to that as well. I think uh, you and David are doing a good job. You're, you're writing about work in a way that nobody else is. It's inspirational and meaningful. And uh, I just went and tried to buy a few other books to give, give as gifts mm-hmm. and they were sold out. Uh-huh. So yeah, uh, tell, help me with that <laughs> <laughs> to get the more more copies. Yeah, of this. more copies of it doesn't have to be finally, crazy at work. Yeah, our publisher uh, underprinted the book, so um, they luck- sandbagged you like they didn't think you were going to be as popular. It was or- interesting. I mean, I'm happy to talk about it. Um, <laughs> it was weird because um, we got a big advance, yeah. and so when you get a big advance, you'd expect that they need to sell a lot of books mm-hmm. to make the money back, yeah. and that they would expect that it's going to be a popular book, and they didn't print enough, <laughs> and. Um, and it wasn't like we sold, okay, they printed about 14,000 copies. Okay. Rework, though, which was done almost 10 years ago, they printed 35,000 copies. And for some reason, they printed 14,000 for this Got one. It. Okay, fine, whatever. Somebody disagreed and committed. Com- <laughs> yes, <laughs> fine, whatever, right? Yeah. But the thing that, that, that was bad about it was that we couldn't get a reprint for about a month. Oh. That's what, so the yeah. momentum was like, we sold out on Amazon in, in five days, yeah. um, thousands of copies, and then out of stock, like shipping two to four weeks, that sucked. But they just printed another, I think, 15,000 or something, so they're back in stock at okay. Amazon and all the booksellers now, so, so you'll just find little, them on the shelves again. Good, there's just a little blip where I A can... little blip. It sucked because like, it kind of took the momentum out of it for a little bit, but the book is back in stock everywhere now. Sorry, I love giving gifts. You can get an audio book, by the way, which yeah. is... Um, it's a great way of giving you get that gifts. Too. Yeah. I, yeah. I love giving um, books as gifts, and. I've been a big giver of rework for a long oh, thank time. Thank you very and, much. Uh, and funny. it doesn't have to be crazy work as a new gift. So, oh, thank you. Thank you so much for writing it. Yes. Thanks for be- being a pioneer in future work and remote and all the, all the things that you've uh, called out here. And thanks for being a guest. Oh, on the man, show. it was really fun. Thanks for having me. Really on. appreciate yeah. it. And for the folks at home, again, here's one more look at the book. Pick up a copy. Um, I'm Chase. This is Ben Jason. And thanks a lot. Have a great day. Hopefully, see you tomorrow. Thank you.